Okay. Hello and welcome to the fifth of six sessions um, in the Hitchhiker's Guide to Artificial Intelligence. Um, today we'll be uh, looking at the um, the architectural office of the future. Um, yesterday we saw some amazing work that was coming out, experimental work, um, especially the work from from Cor Pimmelblau that Daniel Bologian was showing, D. Pimmelblau. Uh, and we saw some really astonishingly inspirational sort of um, work that has been inspired by the possibilities of AI. Um, there's another side of AI, um, and that is to say the practical side of the office itself. Um, to my mind, no matter how amazing some of that work was yesterday, to my mind, the most important uh, driver of change is going to be the way in which the um, AI op 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 operates in the office itself. So in, in sense, some senses, this is the most challenging, um, uh, the most important uh, session um, in, in the entire series, in, uh, to my mind. So, um, and I'm delighted that today we'll be having Wan Yu He um, from X School and Theodora Scalanus to go and um, uh, also to, to be... Uh, um, to be showing their work. And, and I'm also inviting in Runjia Chan, who is um, a, a student at Harvard GSD, who's been really producing some amazing work. And to my mind, the the young students of the day are the future, and it's, it's great to be able to show off their talents. Um, so <clears throat> just to put this in perspective, uh, we've had uh, four sessions so far where we've looked at various aspects in which AI is going to have an impact on how we architects think and how we operate in the office. Um, in session one, we laid out some of the um, some of the kind of the very principles, the basic principles about what is AI. And towards the end, we looked at how uh, GPT-3 has allowed um, Clip and Dali to produce um, images. And we were it was um, great to have a presentation from Theodorus, his first presentation for that particular session. The second session, we began to look at how AIs become generative, how um, uh, GANs and things have developed, generative adversarial networks have developed, and how we are now being able to hallucinate um, uh, uh, some extraordinary new um, uh, um, works coming out of, of using AI. Then we moved on to the session three, AI, media, art, and neuroscience, and Refik Anadol produced some, I think, showed us some of his amazing work. Um, Refik Anadol, not an architect in, uh, uh, as such, but a, a media artist who nonetheless uses buildings as both his medium and also his, his, uh, his, uh, his canvas, as it were, projecting um, his images onto buildings. And then last session, we were looking at um, AI and architectural design. Um, and uh, we had uh, uh, Emmanuel Coe and, and Daniel Bolajan showing us how to, um, the kind of, the, the, the very early work, but the very inspirational work that is really producing a new, a new, a new chapter in architectural design. We also had Ben Asparahi uh, showing us how she has began to, to use AI and incorporate it along with other uh, technologies in a very kind of radical way. So today we, um, we, we're looking at the, the architectural office of the future and to some extent also uh, to, uh, next time in the city of the future, we'll also be addressing aspects of that. We have um, sidewalk um, labs coming in who will be showing us how the, their, their new software is, um, is opening up new possibilities in terms of how the office might operate. Um, so today we'll be looking at the office of the future. And um, just to kind of clarify something, um, I, I showed this image before, this is not what the office of the future will look like. Um, you won't be surrounded by humanoid robots in this way, but you will be surrounded by AI. AI, if you want to think about what AI is, it's really more about algorithms, it's about robots, um, but it, it is everywhere already. Uh, the AI has surrounded us in, in everything we do already within the office. It, it's there. Um, it's certainly there on our personal phones, um, and it's there in, in many, of the, many of the softwares that we're using on our computers themselves. Um, so it's as though it's not as though it's going to be something completely new. It's going to be there already. And there are many um, uh, practices which are already developing possible um, uh, using different techniques and, and using AI. Including Autodesk. Autodesk has has has, um, has got AI apps all over, all over the place, and they are themselves developing new technologies and new ways of of of, of using things. Um, one of the one of the, the the softwares that they've developed is uh, um, uh, uh, Dreamcatcher, which is a form of topological optimization, um, it, which is in some senses a kind of good old fashioned AI. It's not deep learning as such, but nonetheless, it is AI, and it's becoming an important part of how we can sort of use AI to be able to to, to explore performance-based designs. And that's, of course, when it comes to the office, that's one of the crucial aspects we need, need to look at. Uh, Autodesk have explored, for example, how they can use um, 
Dreamcatcher to go and generate a range of different options. In this case, a, a chassis for a um, for a drone. Um, they've also been exploring with um, David Benjamin how to uh, produce a panel um, using a, a kind of swarm-based AI logic um, for an airplane um, to to reduce the cost of the and the weight of the, of the of the panel. And even in their own offices, they've explored how you can use um, AI-based techniques to um, to open up new ways of, 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 of designing an office. So it's clear that, that, that already in many ways we have um, AI that is part of our standard software. Um, but at the same time, there are other things that are beginning to sort of develop and, and specialist software companies which are emerging, which are going to be changing how things are going to happen. What is the future of AI going to be like? Um, one of the the the, the um, interventions I like I like most of all is a, a presentation made by Mike Haley. Mike Haley is in charge of AI development in, in Autodesk, and he describes a future, a future, a possible future for AI, which actually is kind of an interesting one. Um, in in his presentation, for example, he 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 shows how we will be operating in the future by talking to our computers. We won't so much be using a curse. We won't be we won't be uh, drafting the traditional sense, but actually giving instructions to the computer, which will be responding in kind. In this particular case, he's, um, he asks uh, uh, the, the computer to, um, to, to just show him a, a range of chairs in order to go and design a chair. The computer throws up this one. He selects one particular um, chair using a voice command and then requests the computer to go and, to go and to rest, he calls it Autodesk, to, to, to go and give him a range of possible um, chairs based on that design. And so you get an array of these. Out of that array, you then select the one that you want. You, may, you might refine it uh, um, further using, again, voice commands. Um, and then you will possibly look at the, the covering of the chair. Um, and this is a kind of radical vision in many ways. Uh, it's not a, a, a traditional way of drafting. You're using just voice commands. Um, but it's making the computer and making AI incredibly accessible. This is a very straightforward and simplistic sort of way to of approach things. Um, and, and, and it's one vision of the future of what AI might lead to. Another vision is offered by Randy Deutsch. Um, Randy Deutsch is um, uh, a kind of commentator on, 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 on um, an architectural commentator on technology. And he has re recently published a book called Super Users, um, where he describes a new breed of architect or in the office. Um, and in many ways, it's not necessarily a new breed. Um, we've already seen how certain offices have begun to develop um, a specialist in-house research group. Um, I think the first one was possibly Gary Technologies, where Frank Gary realized that in order to get the co these complex buildings um, built in a, in a, in a, a, on cost and on time, he needed to introduce um, software. Um, and, and also not only software, a version of Cotier that he developed um, for the office itself, but also a specialist group of users. Um, and that's where Gary Technologies was born. Um, we've seen similar um, developments in other offices. Uh, Foster and Partners, for example, have the specialist modeling group. Also in Zaha Hadid Architects, we can see um, Zaha Code, um, where they um, uh, have, 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 have played a, a central role in, in, in everything. And I, I would say that in some ways, these are not only the super users, these are the key users in the office today. I, for some years, I, so a few years ago, I was teaching um, with Nick Pisker of Gary Technologies um, while I was at uh, USC. And the challenge was be able to drag um, uh, Nick from the office because he was the most most needed, the most important person in the office. So we can already see that there are kind of like that we there is a group uh, there is a call for a specialist operating this way, um, and 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 in some ways the the the, the offices that we that the, the, the architectural um, um, schools of architecture are also developing individuals for this. That precisely the AADRL is developing a kind of generation of super users, many of whom go on to go and work for Zaha Hadid Architects. The question then is, you know, which one will prevail? The, the, the very straightforward sort of model, um, the way in which, um, for example, uh, 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 Mike Haley is imagining how we can very straightforwardly kind of give voice commands, or these high tech specialists who will be um, who will have skills beyond the average architect. And let's not forget that the, that what technology often does is simply make things very uh, easy. Um, you think about your phone, how you can swipe and how you can do in order to open it, or you can use uh, facial recognition to 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 to, um, to open it. That in many cases, even though the technology is very sophisticated, what it does is make things much easier. 
So we can see two different models, one in which technology is used to make things very simple and straightforward, and one in which we have these specialist technologies. Uh, which is the correct version? Um, to my mind, both will prevail. We will see both those who are um, advanced technologists, who will be specialists, who will be have a, a central role in the office of the future. But also for many people, the use of AI will be there and it'll be, it'll be everywhere. Um, uh, if, if, if you're a student right now, my suggestion is that you want to become a super user because I'm sure for sure that is an area where there is bound to be a, a form of employment. So um, let's take a look at one of the, um, the, the companies then that's been um, developing some software for this. Um, and this is Harvard, Hawk, Harvard Hawkland, who um, set up Spacemaker AI in 2016 with two colleagues in Oslo, Norway. Um, they were immediately successful in, in, in acquiring uh, some capital investment um, and developed very quickly. And actually by October of last year, um, had been acquired by Autodesk for $240 million. This clearly is the way forward. Uh, last, so yeah, last year during Digital, Digital Futures, we, had a, we held a discussion involving um, Harvard Hochland and Maria Dance also from Spacemaker AI with Wan Yu He from Xcool, Daniel Bolajan and myself. And this was a very interesting session. In fact, many ways, the most interesting session, even though the kind of the designs that were being referred to were possibly not quite as kind of provocative or, or experimental as the ones that we saw in the last session. This is one such design that's been um, produced by, um, by uh, uh, been produced by the office for a developer where they're using these tools to try and find ways of um, uh, of of, uh, uh, of of producing a, a design that is 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 based on performance based concerns, the ideas of wind comfort, the idea of views of the of the ocean, and so on, become central towards this thing. So, in a sense, what we we're seeing then is a, is a is a, a way in which I think the AI will be in in standard um, offices become everywhere apparent as a kind of essential tool an essential tool that will be used elsewhere. So they will do studies, for example, using using uh, uh, the computer to go and generate outcomes and then analyze this, in this case, looking at kind of wind comfort um, for this particular design. Um, and there, are, what is also interesting about this particular approach is that they're discovering that often the computer will throw up options that you otherwise would not have thought about. That, to my mind, is also a kind of fascinating aspect of this, that, you'll, that, that it, it's kind of challenging or has been offering counterintuitive solutions to, 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 a, to a particular kind of problem. Um, and, and this is the kind of the comment, I think, well, there were a number of comments that came out of this discussion that really, I think, kind of that made me realize that this is, this is what is going to happen in the office of the future. This is going to be the key uh, game changer. Um, the point being that the computer is able to operate in a very complex way. If you if you think about the the, um, uh, the way that we operate as architects, there are only two mo modalities. One is, a, let's say, a kind of strategic operation. Let's say a bit like urban planning, where we're thinking about massing models and not designing it in detail, but thinking about strategic operations. And then there's the design itself, in a sense, with the, where you look at the aesthetics and how it looks like and so on. It's that former area, the idea of how you can um, strategically develop um, um, innovative solutions that to my mind is going to be the key area here. The, the point being here is that the computer is able to deal with the complexity of the situation and cities are complex. They're very, very complex. And the number of possibilities that uh, might be afforded by a particular site, um, the range of which is possibly beyond what a, an individual architect might even be able to imagine. So this is where the computer comes in. This is where AI becomes essential. It opens up new ways of operating. And this reminds me in many ways of, of the, 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 the famous story about AlphaGo. We've seen this many times, but in some, in some ways, this is the kind of key issue as far as I'm concerned, the way in which AI has kind of, that, that has been used to, um, to, to, uh, to, uh, to show that kind of in some ways the limitations of what humans can do. What was interesting about this particular, this famous move, move 37 in game two, where AlphaGo produced a move that everyone at that time thought was a mistake. Everyone was thinking there's a computer glitch, um, something's gone wrong. And then everyone started smiling and thinking, okay, this is, here we go again. But actually it was not a glitch. It was not a glitch at all. And there were a series of these moves also, uh, uh, other moves as well called slack moves that confused the commentators because they were novel moves never seen before uh, and it wasn't so clear 
until a few moves later, how strategically strategically brilliant these moves are. Um, and that, to my mind, is where AI is going to come in. It is going to is going to show us the the the, the smarter solution, the smartest strategic solution um, for for a, a site. And as such, this is going to make it a, a, in demand. Um, and this is another comment that that uh, that uh, um, Harvard Hochland made, which I thought is really going to be uh, kind of fundamental to how we move forward in the future. The fact is that clients, in this case, developers are insisting that their architects use this software. Why do they want to use that software? Why do they ask their architects to use that software? Because in terms of their return on investment, in terms of the profit to be made from a site, this is really where um, it comes in useful. So in order to maximize profits, you are going to have to be able to use AI. You are going to be forced to use AI. And my, to my mind, this is my conclusion that came out of this research, what we're going to see is actually architects falling over themselves, try and say, I'm using AI more than you are, in a way not so dissimilar to how everyone's now interested in being LEED certified and being more environmentally conscious than others. Uh, it will become, to my mind, a central branding um, aspect of architects. Every architect wants to go and claim they're using AI because they can show that they're going to be much more efficient in their work. Um, they also made the comment, which is kind of interesting in its own way, that the the architects uh, in the, the workplace of the future, architects who are using AI will be replacing those who don't. I'm not so sure that it's going to happen in just that straightforward way. Um, uh, I don't think it's so all of a sudden all the architects who don't use AI are going to get sacked and some, more architects, some architects who use AI are going to be brought in. I think the way this is going to happen, it's a kind of like a like some kind of creep, as it were, some sort of a, a gradual process that um, it will begin to kind of instantiate itself in the office. But in a way, you don't even notice, perhaps. Um, the, 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 the comparison is often made of boiling a frog. I'd never boiled a frog before, but if you want to boil a frog, apparently you, you, you gradually warm up the water so the frog doesn't notice it. If you, if you drop the frog into boiling water, the frog will jump out again. And I get this, this is, I think, to my mind, the way that these technologies will will develop is not as a sudden kind of um, revolution, uh, but it'll be a gradual a process. I mean, last October I was giving a I was in a, a teaching a course on on uh, theory of AI, and one of my students announced to me that uh, Tesla had just um, made available the latest software update so that their cars could become uh, fully self driving. That's the point. When I mean, the self driving car, it's a question of incremental developments until you eventually reach that point. So to my mind, what we're going to have is, is not a sudden revolution, but gradually this will be a pervasive system that will colonize the entire office. Interestingly enough, for um, in terms of um, the way that they use AI, I would say that maybe space maker AI are not as um, progressive as, as companies like Xcool. Um, and we'll have one you uh, presenting some work from Xcool in the future. They see AI, the, the way they see AI is really um, they compare it to how a car operates. Um, a car, a self-driving car, of course, has AI in it, but it also has other things. It, it has wheels, it has a steering wheel, it has a, an engine and so on. And they see AI as being part of a kind of combination of different technologies um, that um, will, will gradually have an impact on, on things. Um, today, then, I want to go and introduce some of these new tools and the way they're being used in the office. Um, to, which, are, to my mind, as I say, it's going to be the game changer. This is the way that things are going to change. And this is how, uh, no matter how fantastic and imaginative that some of the designs that are coming up inspired by AI, it's the way that the office is going to change in the future. There's going to be a central way of, of, um, of, of operating. So I'm going to, at this stage, um, stop sharing my screen. Um, and I want to invite, um, uh, I want to invite uh, um, uh, uh, Theodoros Galanis to to show us some of the work that he's been doing um, in developing new tools for AI. Um, Theodorus, you will remember, was uh, presented on our first session, um, showing us how we can use Clip. But importantly, also, he's been involved in developing a series of what are indispensable tools, infrared and so on, that look at the performance-based uh, operation of, um, of architecture, uh, in, of AI in the architectural office. So Theodorus is, a, is, a, is, a, is also a candidate on the, on the DDES at, at FIU. Uh, it's great to have you here, Theodorus. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Thank you. Thank you for your great introduction. Uh, I will be sharing my screen. One second. I think I can share. So, 
it's trying to load. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, can you see it? Is everything okay? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, thank thank you for the introduction and thanks for having me here. Uh, today I want to discuss a few things that Neil actually talked about. So the title of the of the presentation is from automation to curiosity. And the real question that I have in mind with this is what would you do if you had more time? And I will try to explain the importance of time, I think, in everything that we do. Uh, we, we all know how much time we waste, you know, uh, in meetings or in driving, in traffic, how much time I'm wasting on this slide. So it's, it's always important, but we, we never really sit down to think what would we do if we had more time. And this is what I, I'd like to, to investigate just a little today. Uh, so what this is all about. Uh, so I think one thing is that I believe speculation is crucial to, to progress. So some of what I will talk about are speculative, but some others are not, are quite practical. But again, the idea is that both of these should go together. And this is something that in general practice, but maybe architectural practice as well, because more closer to us, is kind of afraid of, I feel. We are afraid to speculate in practice because we feel there are risks and the outcomes are uncertain. But still, we see around us, and especially in the AI domain, that speculation and research is actually the, the, the tip of the spear, let's say. Uh, also, I want to talk about, uh, about the fact that I think intelligence is, is an outcome. So it's not something that we can inject so easily into our processes, right? It's not like we have this design process in our office and we'll, we'll use this AI tool and make, you know, AI-driven design or intelligent designs. I don't think it's that easy, as easy as it sounds. And finally, maybe discuss a bit uh, about the fact we can, that automation is not augmentation necessarily. So the, I, don't, I don't really believe that because we will automate something, and this goes back to the concept of time, we are actually making things better, right? We are making things faster, perhaps more efficient and more cost effective, which is great, but it, it doesn't necessarily mean we're making things better. And in fact, it doesn't mean we are actually changing something, right? Radically. And I think that if we are to talk about AI in design, we need to have this radical mindset in, in mind, radical change. So, okay, what does it mean to design with intelligence? This slide has a lot of text. I think it's the most text I ever put. So, but we can deconstruct it, it's, it's not a problem. First of all, not all of the text is important, just a few terms, right? And this is what I sketched a while ago, about a year, maybe a year and a half ago, when I was thinking about this next step, right? What, what, what do I want to do? What do I want to do about intelligent design or design intelligence? And I found myself going back to very traditional thinking, actually, thinking that architecture has had or had during the 60s, maybe, right? With the work of, you know, Christopher Alexander or Negroponte and others, you know, they were trying to build systems, much of which Neil described today, but in more contemporary terms, right? They were trying to build systems like, I don't know, uh, Urban Five, where you know users communicated the constraints even with language, right? They were trying to build automated design and all these things, right? But all this generative approach to design, the intelligent generative design in a way, was abandoned, obviously because they were not for the same more or less reasons that AI had its winter. You know, it wasn't ready. I think the ideas were there, but the the, the sort of methodological software, algorithms, compute, all these things didn't exist. So my idea is that we can revisit this now that we can see that we have a lot of these things, right? We have new algorithms, you have, we have new methods, we have a lot of compute and we can scale. So we need, I thought that maybe we revisit. So maybe, maybe we can focus, or I, I chose to focus on a sort of generative design system, but not the way we, we ex describe it today or at least until today. It's not something that, you know, you have some input parameters and you permute them and you generate something. That's not enough. It's just a very small part of this whole system. What does it involve then? And it involves a, a set of modules, like it's a modular system. And I, th I do think it has to be a modular system if we want to create intelligence or extract intelligence. 
And it has to be because that allows for combinations, for complex combinations between all these models, right? And it does very specific things. It captures, it generates, it quantifies, it evaluates, it learns and communicates. This is at least what I put in. Others can put different things. But this is, I think, what we need to have at minimum. So ca capture is quite simple, you know? How, how do we do design? We have, we have constraints, we have goals, we have metrics, we have inputs, right? We have, we have all these things. And we do, every time we design, we add them in some way, right? In computational design, you would add your constraints explicitly, maybe, in your parameters of the model. And outside of you know your computational models, you have course constraints, you have local context, right? You have material constraints and all these things. Generate, what does it mean? Well, we based on all these constraints, the goal and the vision, we, we want to generate some design artifacts, right? We, we do this very typically in computational design and architecture. Then we also want to quantify performance because as Neil was saying, if if this doesn't if, if we don't really apply it on performance, or at least in a normative evaluation of the designs, then what's the point, right? And generative design, at least until very recently, had been about generation alone, I feel. And it, it was one of the biggest, I think, flaws, especially uh, in, in relation to, to it getting adopted in practice. So we need to quantify performance. And then we also need to evaluate designs, which is not the same as quantified performance. So this critique on designs happens in a much higher dimensional space, right? By evaluating, we mean, you know, not just which design has a better value on this metric, but how do, does this design relate to the others in its vicinity, right? How does it relate to all the design space and all these relationships, connections and, you know, interpolations and all such. This is the things that we, we evaluate, we mean by evaluating, right? And also, we can learn. Learning is something that we haven't done, but we can take a hint from, obviously, machine learning, and we can learn from our preferences and from the designs we generate. So imagine a system that embeds a module that actually learns while the user is using it to generate and evaluate and, and critique, let's say, art design artifacts. So, so this is an extra layer of learning that we, we add in order to capture maybe designer preferences, right? In order to make this use more user-friendly and all of this stuff. And finally, communicate. This is probably the most important. So we need to communicate these things. And, and by communicate, we, do, we don't just show graphs. We need to somehow extract a, Latin, a, a message from this latent space, from this high dimensional data, from this big data sometimes. It's not really always. So this is sort of my, my vision of the system, let's say, of the, of the future or of, of a snapshot of it at least when it, when it comes to performative design, right? To performance-based design. And it is generative. And it, is, uh, it does involve humans very much. All these this first two modules involve, involve us, right? Because we need to include, even if we learn all our design preferences, that doesn't mean that this model works automated, auto, in an automated fashion. It just means it's easier, right? You can start off from a point that you were before. So this is... Kind of. Uh, as Neil mentioned, in the first session of this series, I discussed about semantic generation. So very, I won't go back into it, but very quickly, semantic generation kind of takes the role of this, of this left side of the chart. And what does it do? Is a, is a, it just allows you to generate designs or generate artifacts or outcomes, right? Through semantics, through language, right? It's a semantic guided generation. It's very intuitive because we can we can all sort of understand language or use it, you know, in, in various ways. It's easy to use because, as Neil was saying, you don't require code to write a sentence, right? And it allows embedding of arbitrary constraints. We can literally put the constraints in the words themselves, right? We can ask for an apartment that is that has a good daylighting in the bedrooms because that's what we want. We want to have a nice daylighting. When we when we study, or we can ask for an apartment that has a good natural ventilation in your dining room. So you can embed constraints within your data, and of course, then use them to extract designs. And this is sort of like one step. I feel like a frontier, as I, as I explained in the previous session of of design. And in a way, it's very convenient because when I was researching all this, the hardest part was this. Uh, it wasn't really hard, as I will show, or at least due to infrared that I, will, that I will present later, it wasn't so hard to evaluate designs. 
And it's not really hard to learn when you have data. There are many, many techniques and ways to learn from your data, right? And even critique and communicate. Communicate might be a bit hard. I'm not there yet. But the hardest was how do we include the human in the loop, right? And you can imagine that you can build very complex and intricate user interfaces with drop-down menus and then, you know, hundreds of parameters that, you know, represent all our constraints. And then someone, some, a client comes and tells you, oh, I have this new constraint, right? What do I do? I have this new, new type of project. It's, it's almost impossible to have a UI, a software that, does, that hard codes this. So semantic generation allows us to sort of escape that, right? Allows us, if we want to, if we need to, to train models that have constraints that we need embedded. And I think that's, 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 that's perfect. That's wonderful, actually. And as I showed before, this is just one example. It allows us to create things with words. So this, this example creates a, some house layouts with three bedrooms, two bathrooms, and a corridor just because I, I type the words three bedrooms, two bathrooms, and a corridor. So this is sort of the vision, right, of embedding and all the constraints, the visions, the goals, the, the things you can embed them here. There are many other ways that I showed in the presentation. Uh, you can go through it. And then you can start ev from evaluating onwards, right? So it's it's really helpful. So let's say that we, we can do the capture, right? And we kind of do the generate, which I forgot here. But we still have the other stuff to do. So most of the rest of my presentation we will will involve this profit module. I use this this very sort of prosopopoeia for, for my module. So the profit, of course, evaluates because, uh, in a way predicts. That's why it's a profit, right? And why does it have to predict? Because it's impossible, actually, to evaluate at the scales I imagine this to be, to be working, right? Uh, at least right now in the metrics that we care about, right? There are some metrics, you know, for example, you know, things you can extract explicitly, like materials, quantities, costs, all these things can be very fast, right? They are real time. But if you want to do even simple metrics like solar radiation or daylighting, or if you want to move to wind comfort or wind flow, then you need minutes, hours, days, or weeks, right? And you can't be multiplying weeks by 10,000, so that, that doesn't compute. So the way to, to escape that is what I will present forward, our work with infrared. And that work sort of embeds itself in this profit module, right? Embeds itself is in evaluating designs in this dimension, high dimensional space. So what is, what is infrared? Infrared stands for Intelligent Framework for Resilient Design, right? It's a very, very nice acronym, if I can say so myself. And it's developed by, by the CIL team, the City Intelligence Lab in the Austrian Institute of Technology. Uh, the CIL is an interactive digital platform for urban planning, right? And we, we create intelligent solutions, right, for co-creation or generative design. And of course, uh, this started a few years back, but it would never have been a reality without the team, right? There's a lot of people that work in many moving parts of this thing, right? Just having an idea is, is really not enough. I've learned this the painful way. So you need, really need you really need the room in a way. I really like this this idea that the room is smarter than yourself always. So this is this is this is my room and it has been amazing. And I think if I would not have been anything without all of them. Uh, so when I start discussing about infrared, I think the first thing I say is that it is a surrogate model, right? And to explain what the surrogate model is, you, you also almost follow explicitly the uh, the, the term, right? Is a model that as a surrogate, you know, intervenes and says, you know, you don't really need to do this very costly calculation. I will do it for you, right? I'm the surrogate for you. And when I say that this is a deep learning pre-trained model, you know, a lot of people sort of focus on the deep learning part. Oh, that's very nice. How does it happen? But in fact, when I present it, I try to explain to people that the deep learning part is nice. It's really cool. It makes things possible, but it was maybe one or 2% of the effort, right? 99% of the effort was really everything before that, right? Everything that happens before. And what happens before is very painful and painstaking, let's say, data extraction, pre-processing, and actually simulation and all these things. So this is an example from the city of Vienna. We did this in many cities around, in different cities around the world. We extract data, right? From shape files, we create 3D mod models that are need, even need to be cleaned, you know, and sort of made ready for the studies that we want to do, the simulations. And then we just take a lot of time to simulate thousands of them, right? 
and these are some samples, samples from CFD simulations around this, these designs. And then we do it in a smart way, right? This, is, this isn't meant to be uh, validation studies, you know, as I will explain later, infrared is about conceptual design, right? Generative design at scale, ideation is not validation studies. And we are also smart about doing the simulations, right? We can do data documentation in nice ways. We can, we can play with the scale. We can make sure that this is feasible because even with a lot of compute and many different computers in at our disposal, this takes time. And it took the better part of a year, perhaps, to create our, our first data set. And of course, that's only the first step. We, we support three metrics so far. So solar radiation, sunlight hours, and wind flow, which is also used to, to calculate wind comfort, annual wind comfort. But we aim to, to put more, because as I said, the CIL works in, at the urban setting, and it does a lot of work outside of infrared as well which focuses on a lot of analysis that happen in the urban setting. And one thing about the urban environment, and in general, all these complex problems, is that they are very high dimensional, right? They are multimodal. So we need to be able to include these multiple modalities within. So that's the, the goal is to add more and more modalities in order to have a better, let's say, yeah, a better way to explore designs. And I will, I will discuss how having more modalities, you will realize a bit later in the presentation, would I have? And of course, we, we can also validate. So we are doing, we are, we are working on the publication a bit slowly, unfortunately. Uh, but you know, there is also validation studies. We even have models that predict their own loss, right? So you can have an idea of, you know, where is my model sort of overestimating, underestimating, you know, which is which is important for some people. Again, I will I will stress that this is not meant for validation, right? This is not something you use to replace, I don't know, the the CFD expert you hire at the last day of your project to do your, you know, your lead certification or actually lead doesn't have a guess yet, or your green mark certification. This is meant for the very first day. And in fact, with methods that I will show later, even before the very first day. So there is an error, of course, there is a loss, of course. This is, for example, CFD has a loss anyway by, by simulating. But this loss is at acceptable ranges for at least this, uh, this part of the, of the process. I would, I would expect something between 5 and 20% loss, depending on the areas where you're on. Of course, the 5 over 20% comes with a reduction of, I don't know, 99.99% of time. So we are well, well, well beyond the 80-20 golden rule. Okay, so what does infrared allow? It, it allows for very robust workflows, right? Here you see it embedded within a grasshopper script, right? and a rhino model, and you see how the designer can move around things. Here we are moving a point. We are literally moving the park around an urban area, right? And annual weight comfort is updated in real time. So this video is in real time. No cut frames, not anything. You can change some streets and take away, you know, create new geometries. Weight comfort is again updated in real time. So it allows for, for this, uh, these workflows, which are Amazing because they are real time, but they're also very robust. In what way, I think? If you notice on the left, there is a metric, right? And the metric, of course, because we are, we are working on the danger and comfort scales, is about you know 98.5% to 99%, right? So I could sit here and say, we really improved this. But in reality, it's too, someone can say, hey, but it's just 2%. Is this is really helped. But the, the robustness doesn't come from there. It comes from having the ability to visualize your data, right? at a very high, at a refined level. So what does this mean? It doesn't mean that we care that we bring 98 to 99. On the contrary, it means that what we are doing, we are visualizing this 1%, right? Where does it happen? Why does it happen? What happens to it if I do this intervention? So the point of this robust workflows is that it allows us to really find out where the interventions should be very early on in the design. As for example, here in this corner of this big square building, you can see the comfort is lower there. So this is what I mean by robust, robust for workflows, not just quick and fast, but also uh, showing results at a very, very high refinement in a way, allowing for very uh, detailed, let's say, insights, if not interventions, right? Uh, also, the other thing that it enables, I think, is a few new ways of design. One of these comes from gaming, right? I really like gaming, and I think I think it has very 
very wonderful ideas for architecture and design. So one idea about gaming, uh, and at least what I mean gaming, it's not just playing games, but also procedural content generation, all of this, is the, the, the human computer interaction, right? There is, there is always like a, or at least they, they try to have an interaction between, you know, human and computer. And infrared allows this, right? It allows the designer, as you see here, to start drawing masses, right? To start ideation, to start saying, okay, what happens if I take this building out? Okay, that's nice. And in the free space that I create, maybe I build a tower, right? What happens if I build this tower here? And very quickly, you can start getting results, right? In, in real time, as you move and as you interrogate the space. And I think this is useful. I don't necessarily think it's the most useful, probably because I, uh, this is not how, what I do in, in my practice, but for people who do ideate, who do want to ideate in early conceptual design, this will be perhaps more useful than the generative aspect, right? So this is, I think, a new way of design. And I think this is something that we, we haven't had a lot in architecture. And I think especially this human computer interaction and how our interfaces work and the feedback, how the feedback happens is really, is really difficult, right? Anyone who has done computational design like knows the difficulties of it, right? And how, how clunky it can be, how difficult. And I think that this opens wonderful new, new ways of, of design. And of course, it, it also allows you to play, right? Uh, this gamification in a way is being playful, right? And as I said in the beginning, being speculative, you know, like, you know, maybe give, give your buildings life in a way, right? Make them, you know, use as here in the bottom, you can use a reinforcement learning approach, right? To give your building life and have them move around and following an objective, let's say. Or you can just tell them, you know, just move around and see what happens, right? And show me what happens. And then in a way, this is the first baby steps towards really large scale, scale design which is not as easy as it sounds. This generative part is not as easy because I don't think we really know how to do large scale generative design because it's not that we don't know, it's not we don't have the chance to do it. So if, we, if I asked people, even me, to make a large scale generative design, they can make a grasshopper script that creates 10 million designs, but they won't necessarily be any diversity in it. So, this sort of playful ways is also for us to, to identify how can we create diversity in generative design under the guide of performance. And this is, this is a, very, a very important question. And is a, it goes back to you know, uh, actually applying this to, to their full potential in practice. Because if we just take our current workflows, right? If you just take your current workflows and you plug in infrared, which you can, you will get very big improvements, right? You will, but it's not necessarily radically different. So infrared allows for almost instantaneous results, right? Across complex and costly metrics. It scales very efficiently, and especially with compute, and has acceptable accuracy. So that's good, right? And I'm not, it is good. It is very good. And I've used it, right? I've used it daily. I've used it in many experiments. I will show you some. It's amazing, actually. It's it's sort of mind-blowing and very different than how I used to work, where I was waiting literally days for one thing just to see that I did a mistake and I need to go back. So that's good, but I don't think it's completely actualized. And I really like this, I really like this animation from, uh, from Finding Nemo, because I, I do think that if you use infrared, like I said, right, in your workflows, as there are, as there are right now, if you plug in infrared, you will see a, a huge difference, right? But it still feels like you, you dive into the sea, but you're still wearing this protective suit, right? You're still not swimming, you're not, you're not wet. And I, I think we need to find my next step after infrared started working and we know we knew it was working. My next step and our next step was, okay, now what? This is the question, right? Now what? So but we go back to the question, what would we do if we had more time, right? If you had infrared and you could do instantaneous evaluation of your design, what would you do, right? Some people might say, I'll go out for a coffee, right? I don't need to wait for so long. That's perfectly acceptable. Others might say, okay, I will do, you know, I will do what I was doing much more efficiently. And now I can, I can do more projects. I can do more of the same across, you know, across the world, and which is also very nice. It's cost effective, increase your profits. But you can also say, well, we can do something different, right? And what is this different? And I think this different is, it goes back to this idea. How can we scale up with diversity and really explore, right? Really be curious, curious about our designs. 
And so let's see what we could do more. So first, yeah, we can do more. So as I said, you can plug this in into your workflows, right? You can plug in right into your current workflows and you can start combining it with other things. So for example, here, my colleagues are using during he combined infrared with other other metrics of connectivity, you know, density, you know, transportation. And I, I, I will just, and I, I think this, this should have been playing again, I'm sorry. And he, he combined it with many different things and he, he explored the design within, embedded within his own design tools, right? In a, in a very, in a multi-objective manner without necessarily the pains of actually multi-objective optimization, right? Of course, he did do an optimization, but at least he was able to do it in a higher, a higher objective space, let's say. I'm sorry, I need to go. Okay, so we, we could do more, but we can also do something different, right? So back, back then, about, about two years ago, I came across this idea, uh, which is very nicely explained in this book by Ken Stanley and Joel Lemon, uh, why greatness cannot be planned, the myth of the objective, right? And this idea is very simple and very profound. So what, what they found and what they tried to explain in this book is that perhaps what is holding us back is the fact that we have objectives, right? And this is a very simple idea, but if you actually believe it, right? If you actually say, yes, because I have an objective to optimize my energy performance, this is what's keeping my designs back, it really makes you think and it really changes the way you do things, right? And I think that, in my opinion, this idea and what it, it brought after that, a whole field called quality diversity, is really a frontier for architecture, right? This is a way to do things very, very differently. It's a paradigm shift, and I will explain how. how. This, this is a very famous paper that came out 2014 and it went on Nature in 2015, I think. And what they did is they used this idea of no objective, just exploration, right? Let's, let's explore a wide range of alternatives without optimizing anything or explicitly optimizing anything, right? But trying to find great things at everything. And they trained a robot controller, right? It's a very simple project, problem, simple, it's very complex, but it's very typical problem in robotics. Everyone has been doing it. Other people have been doing this idea of optimizing, right? They were optimizing the gate, the walking according to the shape of the robot. So why do this thing? Why, why use so much computation to find 10,000 controllers instead of one? Well, it turns out that it's very helpful, right? Because what happens if your, if your robot breaks? What happens if, if one of these legs breaks, right? Well, in this case, the robot goes back to, him, to its memory and finds another area that was useless before because it wasn't as good as the six uh, walk gate, right? And it says, okay, this is a bit better, so it updates. And then it goes back and it says, okay, what about this one? Oh, this is a bit better, and it updates. And then very quickly, and in fact, I think it's 40 milliseconds or something, it finds a gate that it was as fast as before with one leg less, right? And to me, this is, this is quite mind blowing, right? And, and I thought when I saw this, I thought, why can this be buildings, right? Why, why, why don't we design in this way? Like, do we really believe that there is no fault in our designs? The, do we, and I, I, I remember like, you know, I, that there's a lot of discussion about robust and robustness and, you know, how to be resilient, right? And I think this is true resilience, right? It's not to be, this is like true resilience in a way to adapt to new conditions, but only because you had imagined all these conditions during your design, right? So can we do something like this in architecture? Can we imagine all the possibilities, even though we want to use only a small subset of them? And this is actually what, I, what we tried to do in a, in a recent paper that is going to be published in the, in the Genetic and Evolutionary Computation Conference this year. It's called Archelitz, Quality Diversity for Urban Design. And what, I, what it does, it brings together these ideas that I mentioned, right? It brings together this quality diversity that I will explain in a second, a bit more, and it brings together also infrared. Why? Because quality diversity, and as I explained before, works at, at really high scales, right? You need tens and hundreds, thousands of evaluations. And it seems like that is a waste, but it's not, but it is very difficult to, to scale. How can you scale it where you can use something like our profit infrared? So this is what we used here in order to generate, let's say, cities with different parameters. Of course, the examples above 
they're not real cities because they, this was a toy experiment to test to test the combination of ideas and showcase that it's possible to happen. So the next step is actually embedding this into infrared and happening at the scale level, right? So, so what you can do, you can explore a huge design space, right? Instead of optimizing. So here you see like a very smaller crop of like all the different sort of cities that it finds across different parameters, right? And this is a very, maybe a nicer image. And what is this parameters? Why is this different, right? First of all, we design in what we call a behavioral space and not an input space. Everyone that has done computation design knows that we design on an input space. You do your grasshopper model, you have a, a bunch of sliders that are constraints or goals, and you have ranges and you design by moving the sliders. So you move into the input space, right? You try to generate designs based on the input space and evaluate. Quality diversity allows you to define behavioral spaces that have nothing to do with the inputs, or they have implicitly to do with the inputs, but not explicitly. In this case, we use dangerous space, right? Square meters under danger in wind comfort and comfortable space, right? And we computed this with infrared. And what you do, you do is you say across this range of comfort and danger that I accept, please find everything that you can, right? And keep at the top the best ones. So this is in very simple terms what quality diversity does. It creates a whole collection of designs, right? That are the best performing at their own niche, right? So you can imagine that our typical architectural optimization, design optimization architecture, does at most one of these squares, maybe two layers of these squares. And at that location, it finds a really good design. This is how we do design, right? Very narrow, narrow location defined by our inputs and, and you, you optimize. Quality diversity expands this. It says, I don't want you necessarily to find the best in this whole space. I want you to find the best at each, at each location of this space, right? And the, the very profound insight of this is that the top left corner that has very low comfort and very high danger that would otherwise be useless in our optimization process might be a stepping stone to a better design at the bottom right, right? And in fact, it can. I'm not showing here the, the lineages of these models, the evolutionary lineages, but a lot of these good designs come from other cells at areas that were suboptimal, right? So this is the profound thing. And the other profound thing is that when we create this collection, right, if we do this one for a very well-defined problem, right, we can actually learn, right? We can actually get new insights, right, to communicate. We can extract design intelligence because we can ask our design space, you know, why are these models up here in the top left? What is their difference, you know? What makes them different than these comfortable or better performing models in the bottom right, right? Uh, how can I go from these very bad models to these very good models in sort of like five steps? What do I see in between? What are the differences? So you can, you, you understand this different idea, right? You can literally investigate and interrogate your design space and communicate, as I was saying before, with, with profit. So I think this is a, a tremendous new paradigm shift in architecture, right? And, okay, the next step, of course, you can do is you can share it with the world. And this is what we did a few days ago. So infrared came live, uh, became live, our alpha is out and uh, you are very welcome to apply and use it. So it has a very nice UI, I would think, you, where you can use and the more, the, for some reason it keeps stopping. And you can use it, you know, to predict, to do almost all the things I mentioned, apart from the quality diversity, I'm st we're still working on this, but you can use it for interrogating your designs in a nice interface in real time. Uh, you can explore, you can save a lot of, you know, snapshots as we call them, and a design space you can compare. So it's an alpha, of course, it will come with a lot of bugs and things that users that we need, we want. Uh, to suggest, but it's out there for you to try it, and I, I highly recommend that you do it. And and I really think you know it's a it's a first step, let's say, to actually un answering this question: What can we do if we had more time? Because infrared, I think, it might be the first tool that actually gives you this time to think and play and and investigate. So yeah, that, that was my presentation from Automation to Curiosity. Thank you for your time. And I hope that I at least made you uh, minimally more interested and curious in all these things. Thank you very much.
Theodorus, that was great. Thank you. Thank you. There's actually a question in the in the chat here from Ashke Kuma. Will infrared come as a, a plugin for Grasshopper? How does it work? Yeah, so at the moment is a is a web platform. So you can you can if when you get access, you can log in from your browser. But yes, we are working on Grasshopper integrations for some reasons that are quite obvious. It won't it won't be natively all in Grasshopper because as I said, you want you really want to put to to use it to its full, its full potential. You want to scale things up, right? You want to do different things, and Grasshopper is not the best at the moment at scaling at these scales, right? So some things will always be, let's say, outside, but the connection to Grasshopper will happen. Yeah, so you will be a very very easily, hopefully, extract your model, send them to your to the backend, to infrared backend, visualize them in the web platform. Hopefully, you can extract whole design spaces and then do the all the assessment and visualization outside of that so yeah that will happen uh, very soon hopefully uh, maybe just a kind of fo other follow-up question i mean so how do you imagine the kind of workflow of the architect i mean it seems like it's going to radically change the workflow that's that's for sure uh, we were discussing this yesterday in terms of the kind of the use of these gans and things and how they're going to yeah. going to change the kind of design thing um so that that's but the, my, my question though is I, I, is, do you think it's going to leave more time, or do you think that with the more that the competition is going to be such that the thing is going to shrink? I mean, it, uh, is it going to make life easier, or is this competition going to be mean that we get, we have to produce things quicker? Yeah, I think I think you're right. Like the the competition and the whole yeah, it will lead to sort of let's make things more efficient, faster, so we can do more, right? So necessarily, no, we won't have more time. Maybe we have more time for meetings, I guess, which is maybe not not the best thing. But if used right, I think yeah, we could. I think we could have more time, and and in the sense, at least more time to investigate. If not like uh, the current project, but things you can do with these technologies. That's what I mean also by more time. And I went back to my notes when you were presenting, and I, I had a couple. I think of things that that go with this question. You talked about the super users, and you know what will prevail, and all these contingent solutions, like. I think this is what I try to show towards the end is a way to truly get contingent, like new solutions, right? We can't do it with optimization. That's my claim. I don't think you will get anything that will surprise you, but you can do it if you say, let's not optimize and search. And about the super users, I think, especially if we can make the semantic stuff work and all these things, like you said, technology can make things easier. So the, the goal should be to have these tools for all users and not super users, right? but also allow open source knowledge and collectives like digital futures, right? For users to become super users if they want, right? So somewhere in between, yeah. So yeah, I think they will change. Hopefully they will change for some, but yeah, a lot might have still the same workflows. So um, Daniel also has a question. So um, Daniel, go ahead. Uh, hi, Tedors. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, so also yesterday we ha we had a, a similar discussion and um, we were looking in a way at the impact. Okay, my cat is saying hello also uh, to the world. Um, so we were looking at the impact of um, AI, what the impact AI is going to have versus uh, what impact parametric design had. And in the end, the problem with parametric design was that we ended up with this kind of hotspots in a way where you have a few offices that really engage fully with parametric design and then you have offices that they barely engage with digital yeah and we were discussing like can we somehow overcome this uh, problem and can we uh, develop ai in such a way that we don't end up just with a few hot spots so the question for me will be here uh, in, in a similar line uh, with uh, with what neil was saying how is this going to be different than uh, from what happened in a way with parametric design because also when we when we uh, we got presented all this idea of uh, parametric design, computation, and so on, this was the main argument. Yeah, that we actually we are going to have more time for design, and we know we all know what actually happened. Yeah, in the end, what happened is uh, we started to generate more with less uh, people. Yeah, and uh, how which will be the difference then AI versus parametric design? I'm muted. Uh, so I think, yeah, that's a great question. And there is always the, the, that problem, I think, yeah, like 
you know, how, how will it be different than before? I think in some ways the parametric design or the genetic design, let's say ideals or visions of the visionaries of the 60s, they weren't really uh, followed through completely. So I think partly why, the fault of why, you know, we never had this sort of efficient stuff might be this. But you're very right in, in the sense that a very small community uses them. I, I do computational design and I usually, when I was presenting my work before, I, I would say we and, you know, we all do, uh, but that's everyone, would, but people would tell me not really, you know, maybe like 5% of people in our company would, would understand this grasshopper script, right? And then I, I, would, I would really go back and think. And I think one of the reasons this AI, AI can be different is the reason I explained with the semantic generation, we can make interfaces that abstract us, right? That are sort of sort of headless. They don't require design software or ex necessarily design expertise to use them. And I think that's great. Like we need to democratize access to design itself, right? That doesn't mean that we take away everything. You know, the experts are not experts anymore. Of course, there are. Everyone has, you know, their value and really a place in the design process. But early on, we can. I think AI offers more possibilities. For this sort of sort of headless and even code-free in a way, right? Intuitive workflows. That that would be sort of my 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 answer to like, do you think it will be different? Now the other part of like we will do le more with less, yeah, of course. Like this is market pressures, and I'm not sure how how you can change that unless you are in practice. So this is also my my goal for the next years is actually to 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 put all these seeds in practice, right? And not just have them floating around as, a, as, as ideas. And I think maybe what, what can happen or will happen is, yes, we will do more with less, but that also means not simply companies coming down or cutting down on costs, but also maybe smaller, innovative companies coming up, right? That, that you know, solve specific problems in new ways, you know? So maybe that offers a new playground in a way, like a business playground. And that might be, might have a potential. and might make for you know a better way of working i'm not sure about that but it could so this is yeah but the market pressure will, will always be there i think and the other thing that changes i think dramatically with these workflows is who you are talking to right i think they'll mention like you know autodesk for example you know and space maker deal i think there was a reason for that right many reasons it wasn't just ai and i think companies do see this in a way like you know who do my tools talk to, right? Who do they refer to? I think this in AI-driven AI tools, or let's say the design intelligence tools, they can talk to more people than experts, right? They can talk to more than architects, right? They can talk to developers. They can talk to marketing people, maybe. They can talk to a broader range of us. So that will also change how things are done, I think. So yeah, it's, it's a very interesting time. I, I, I can't say it will be better, you know? But I do think it will be different, which is at least interesting and curious. Yeah, um, I think I think those are great points, and um, I think it's up to us in the in the end, yeah, how we design these systems, yeah, to to make it better. And I think this observation of you know uh, that the amazing thing could be that actually um, smaller offices maybe it's better than having bigger offices, yeah. It could be that similar with what Tomain was pointing out in one of our uh, discussions last, uh, last summer in Digital Futures. He was talking about this idea that maybe, yes, maybe AI is going to help me and I'm going to have just three, four uh, people in the office. I'm going to be able to pay them uh, fairly and a very good, uh, very good uh, salary. And we are going to be able to uh, create the same amount of projects. Yeah? And I think that's going to empower in a way a lot of people that right now it's very hard to compete. Yeah, if you think about competition yeah, between offices, it's very hard for you as a young architect starting an architectural practice. It's very hard to compete with uh, larger offices. But once you have this kind of tool set next to you, maybe that gives you a competitive advantage. And suddenly, then we can bring like new talent that right now it's not in the market because yeah, because the pressure, yeah, the the, the kind of competition that is out there that talent maybe is going to be exposed now to the market. So I think that's, that's a great thing actually. Yeah, that's a great point. The talent point is great. I've been, I think for years I've been, I've been sort of being doom and gloom about it. Like uh, the talent drain, like there are many reasons. It's not just money, money is a big reason, but it's also like really fun to do these things, right? It's much more fun to like experiment with these things. Even like, 
you know, deep learning things than, you know, Grasshopper script. So like, in a way, like this talent drain is big and we keep asking, like, we need architects who can code, but yeah, we need also coders who can design, right? So, so this is a, a great way of opening up the industry, yeah. As for this, this bigger companies, I don't think like they go away, of course, no. But I do think they will also change themselves. Like, I think it's, you know, maybe like smaller groups within that are flexible in generating new things, new tools, spinning off things. So I think it's going to be interesting times, yeah, very interesting times. And I hope it's going to be better for young architects. Yeah, I do. I really do. To sort of either find their niche or do something new. Neil, I see a question in the chat. Do you want me to yeah, answer? Yeah, uh, Munja like has that? a question as well. Yeah, go ahead, Munja. Okay, so the first question about the black box is very nice. We can discuss for hours of the, for this. Like, I think there are two things here. Of course, deep learning models are a black box, right? Three things. But any model is a black box, right? I think. Actually, the European Union in the GBDR, right? They don't say, ah, don't use uh, deep learning models, use decision trees, because deep learning models are a black box. They say the final decision always happens. Uh, you, you always have the right to, to, to challenge the decision. And then a human intervenes, right? Why? Because they're all black boxes. That's how they define it. And even though this is like policy thing, I, I really like it because I think everything is a black box. It's not just, oh, deep learning is a black box and now what happens? That's one thing. The other thing is that it's not also completely true. There has been five years at least of incredible work, right? And there is literally a new uh, spin-off out of OpenAI right now, right? It's called Anthropic AI. If, if you don't know it, go, go and check it out. That was created for this purpose, to push this interpretability forward. There has been huge strides in model interpretability. I think right now you can interrogate transformer models, deep learning models, much better than linear regression. You can actually visualize what the attention is looking at, uh, you know, make all these heat maps, you know, understand, you know, the, what words, all these relationships. So it's not anymore a black box. It's not that much a black box, I think. So I wouldn't be so scared about that. In fact, I think we can get new insights by using deep learning and then looking inside of them as they look at our data sets, right? And the last question very quickly, I see a reinforcement learning question. Uh, that was a, a small experiment. I want to I wanna be a bit, you know, like, I don't know if anyone remembers Lacan's uh, cake metaphor, right? His metaphor was, you know, like supervised learning is the whole cake and then RL is the cherry on top. He's actually been right the last five, four years since he's held it. So super, self-supervised is everywhere. RL is still kind of, it's not really a meme, but I'm very harsh by saying it's a meme. Like it doesn't really work in the real world. It's very brittle, very difficult to, to do. And in architecture so far, the things that I've seen are just using RL as optimizing things and not really designing edges. But I think it has a place. And if you go back to my previous presentation in this series, uh, I have an, a, a new RL idea that I think has a place in design. Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much. So um, we've just been joined by Wan Yu, which is just in time, fantastic. Um, uh, I wanted to introduce, welcome um, Wan Yu, um, and invite her to present something. Um, what's interesting about the the whole uh, um, about Space Maker and XCool, and we found out last last summer, is that actually they were founded all, exactly the same year, two thousand sixteen. Very similar companies in many ways. Both attracted um, significant investment, and are both. Um, uh, uh, taking a, a lion's share of the market, although when, uh, uh, XCool is um, uh, operating in China um, in a very different situation in the sense that the data that they use is, is specifically for the Chinese market. Um, Wan Yu, I should say, is a, a, um, a graduate initially the, um, from, from came from China, went to the, the Berlaga in, um, in in the Netherlands, studied under Peter Trauma, um, and then went to work for um, Rem Koolhaas for seven years. Um, so the name X Cool, um, some of you might realize, is X Koolhaas. Um, it's also um, a, a reference to the kind of in in the, the urban dictionary, um, X Cool means super cool. Um, anyway, um, it's, uh, X Cool hasn't been brought up by all desk um, and I think what I would want to suggest is there's a very interesting kind of debate going on right now um, between the kind of Silicon Valley and and and, and Shenzhen um, 
uh, there's a huge competition, or even though these are not competing with one another, um, there is nonetheless a bigger competition that Kai, uh, Kai Fu Li has written about. Um, and what's interesting also about the uh, about the situation in, in in China is that it was that very moment that I was talking about in terms of the the match between AlphaGo and and um, and uh, 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 the the Korean player that really triggered things off because in the West. What does Go mean? I mean Go is, 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 I mean, chess is our game. Go is not. But in China, Go is the national go game. So um, uh, at that point, when, when several million Chinese viewers uh, saw this match being played, that was a kind of crucial moment in terms of, of, of a kind of raising awareness about, you know, why everyone had to get into AI. And, and frankly, in China, we have a number of Chinese uh, uh, um, uh, colleagues in this, in this uh, discussion today. In China, AI is the name of the game. It's unbelievably how important it is. So I'd like to um, welcome uh, Wan Yu to, uh, to say a few words about, about uh, XCool and the extraordinary work that they're doing there. Welcome, Wan Yu. Thank you, Neil. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. And uh, I'm going to uh, share something we're doing uh, in based in Shenzhen. So let me share my screen first. Wait a second. Okay. Okay. Can you see my screen right now? Yes. Yes. Okay, cool. Uh, then my topic is about uh, how AI can help in AI, uh, can help in the architectural design. And uh, uh, I will start with something, maybe not that much architectural design, but the, the content of the society we are facing today. Uh, a short uh, introduction Neil already made uh, about myself, but here is uh, something I worked as an architect. So ma majorly are those uh, iconic buildings with OMA. But are those buildings are our uh, majority of the society? Maybe not, because we are facing a, a big uh, development environment, uh, mostly in China, but also in the developing countries. Uh, Chinese uh, population, urban population is growing uh, from 24% uh, to 50.5 uh, in 2018, but in today, China is already 61%. And uh, in 2030 to 2035, it is a plan to be 75%, which means we have a massive production going on here in recent 10 to 15 years. Uh, maybe it's uh, very similar in like India, uh, Southeast Asia, some parts of the, um, uh, the Africa, maybe. But we compare with the, uh, Europe and uh, the States, we can see they are really already um, fully or like a really good developed uh, in the urban uh, ratio. So this is something we are facing in the future. And there's also something new. Uh, maybe some of the people uh, are really um, noticing about Chinese news. They will know uh, China just get the seventh population uh, checking and the result is, uh, is shocked to, to all Chinese because we have a, like a, a four, 35% unable working uh, people like the Jews and the elders. So which means this diagram is a coming true. Uh, it is a be uh, predicted by the World Bank. But uh, today we are somewhere here in 2021, uh, the blue lines China. We are vanishing our workers. We don't have enough worker. And so this is a, a contradiction we are facing. In, on one hand, we have a lot of work to do in terms of the urban development. And in another hand, we are vanishing our workers. We don't have enough people. And maybe some people know China better. There's some, one more thing you need to notice is the most young people in China, um, I mean, for the workers, 
they used to work in construction site, like uh, from 20 to 50 years old, this range, there's a lot of people, but right now they are working on something else, like the delivering, food delivering and the goods delivering, and also uh, the Uber car driving. So they are choosing other uh, jobs. They're not choosing architectural construction job. And also it's similar to uh, architects field because previously architects are uh, sounds a lot in China, but uh, if we compare with the, the, the density or the people we are serving, we still lacking of architects because we have a large population here in China. We have a 1.4 something billion population. Uh, so this is a, a diagram from Archidaily. So we have a lot of things to do, but the point is uh, we only get a, a very limited uh, uh, architects to dealing with uh, such large development and large amounts of the population. And if we look at our um, this, uh, this structure of our uh, professionals, we will see the juniors and the middle level are the, the majority. The senior and the master is a very limited, especially when the master become a master. It means a master will get retired soon. This uh, architecture is a kind of a, a job for the elders, let's say. It's some, some people say so, right? So why is this? I mean, why we have this structure? Because our uh, profession is composed by teach and learn because we need to get a enough experience to become a master or a senior. And this procedure is quite long. And the difference between the master and the junior is really big. For instance, like, like here, Ms. Van der Rohe and his, uh, I don't know, uh, his architects in his office, this young architect, they think totally different. And uh, how can we uh, keep teach and learn or keep our um, major, this uh, architectural discipline, keep going on? The previous way or the traditional way is to deliver it by human intelligence. Uh, I, as a people, I learn from my, my mentor, my supervisor, and uh, I uh, grow my intelligence, my experience, uh, my profession. This is uh, how we do in the future, uh, in, the, in the past, sorry. But in the future, it should be the same. Uh, we, can, we can check on this part. Uh, because when we look back to what is intelligence, why human beings uh, 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 common the knowledge like this is because uh, the, the elders are like uh, more smarter than us or even uh, like this one, they are, th these people are really our uh, ancestor like uh, 60,000 years ago. Or are they more stupid than us in terms of IQ? No, they're not. Because you, are, you look at them, they are also building houses. But uh, why they look so savage, let's say? Because the environment they are facing are different. They are facing the trees, the mountains, uh, the animals there, and that's it. This is something they're dealing with. But are they like uh, because of the years? So they are different from us. It's not. And also here is this is some some people like in nearly uh, in, in two hundred years they are close to us. I mean, in terms of the the people mind, uh, in terms of the the people uh, uh, identity. Let's say in AD sixty nine, but they still seems very savage. Why is that? Because their environment, or let's say, because the data they are reaching, the information they are reaching, they are reaching the very similar condition as 60,000 years ago. 
So this is uh, how they dealing with the external world. This is very become very interesting because when we're talking about uh, machine learning or machine learn things like that, it's not machines are machines, right? Machines are um, inputting, outputting, and you adding the calculation power, it can be faster. And if you um, improve the algorithm, it become faster. Yeah, that's machine. And the machine can represent in different ways, like the uh, algorithms uh, to do the design, like CAD. Yeah, this is a, what machine intelligence doing. It's different. It depends on what you input and what's the power, the engine. Like, yeah, the CAD softwares, uh, those softwares are usually we use. And the last uh, topic about the uh, artificial intelligence or this one, I mean, also called intelligence, it's similar as the previous, it's really not. Because artificial intelligence here means uh, we got a new type of uh, uh, deep learning or even uh, some other neural networks and those neural networks can help the machine or the, the AI to understand better the condition and even can um, reaching out the unknown. So we cannot keep, uh, we can like uh, uh, do a comparison between the machine learning and the biological learning I think in some ways are similar. From the human being point of view, we get a, a biological recognition with our eyes, our nose, our ears, and we get all those informations and we are analyzing our, um, the things we are, we are learning, we are watching, we are, we are thinking. This is a little bit similar as the neural networks in terms of machine learnings. You input data and then uh, the processing it, it outcomes. But the difference is here is not just the analyzing, but it's going to uh, the, the neural networks help it to understand much better or uh, generate better. So what all these uh, uh, things I was talking about above uh, is something I want to share it here. Maybe people are, uh, some of you are watched this TV series called the West World season two. Uh, it says something there. The truth is that a human is just a brief of algorithm. Uh, 10,247 lines. So this is uh, interesting. They think people or the um, imaginary AI is a thinking people are algorithms because think people are easy to predict. So when things are easy to predict, it can be um, programmedized in this point of view. So we can somehow summary what is uh, uh, about how we learn, how we think, how we deliver uh, or pass on the knowledge of architecture. There's uh, several things. First is the methodology. So it's same to almost everyone. If you studied some in, in the school, you get the methodology. And the IQ we just saw is almost the same to everyone, even to the ancestors. So only difference is the knowledge and experience. And the knowledge you can, yeah, somehow learn from school, learn from yourself, uh, the books. But experience here, you cannot. You have to experience it. But if we translate all those terms into what machine can understand, will be algorithms, data, calculation power. Algorithms is it's just like the methodology we are forming in our human mind. And the, the calculation power is equal to the IQ if we um, considering a machine. 
And the data is the knowledge and uh, uh, the experience for the machine. So only difference between algorithms or not is not, uh, not just algorithms, the difference between the AI, let's say, like AlphaGo or uh, AlphaGo uh, or Alpha something else. I mean, uh, DeepMind is also doing in um, other fields, right? Like uh, the mechanical fields, they're different. They are dealing with a different knowledge. So the most difference is, is data. And the data difference made the AI different. So there's a lot of uh, uh, applications in different ways. They are using different type of AI, like Watson also got the different types. So this is uh, uh, how AI is doing. Why we are looking into this? Because we're thinking, in the future, are we just uh, working with our own? I don't think so. I think we are working with AI. And uh, first of all, we need to understand AI and what AI can do. Uh, previously, uh, also uh, in this other digital future courses, I, I totally uh, uh, know that a lot of uh, speakers are already talked about AI. So uh, I just want to share what we do here and see and, uh, and sharing what we are thinking the future architectural office or the architect professional could be. I think uh, uh, this is a very good example. It's a, a doctor, uh, as you see at, in, on the image. The left side is a um, very experienced uh, uh, doctor. You can see from his age. And he's checking on the chest uh, x-ray uh, image. And he can easily find out what's the issue. But, uh, for the, uh, but for the young doctors, they have to accumulate their experience, their cases. So they have to learn uh, for a long time. This is a very similar as the architectural field. But this thing is changing in the doctor um, it is a, a profession, medical profession as well. The changing thing is AI. There's a, it is a, a TV program in China. It's called uh, AI versus human. You see on the left side, there's a, uh, a computer and with a, a lot of uh, data of the uh, brain scanning images. And on another side are the, the doctors, the, the senior doctors, let's say. They are comparing to uh, dialogize the, the issues. Are this uh, image okay or with a potential uh, symptoms or potential issue? They need to find out and they just uh, compare this, um, this thing. Uh, this uh, skill, let's say. And eventually, yeah, yes, the machine wins because it's faster and also the, uh, the, the accuracy is higher. It's like 92% or something and the, the, the human doctors are 84 or something. So this is a, a comparison, but it will uh, scare people. So doctors will lose their job. They will not be doctors anymore. No, of course not. Doctors is keep being doctors. It can uh, do other a, a lot of complicated uh, uh, case uh, uh, checking. But the, the the machine here, it can just do one thing: checking the the brain uh, scanning or other uh, chest scanning. This is uh, the machine doing. It's a little bit like the cars. So today we are not comparing like running with the cars. We are not comparing speed with the cars, right? No people is doing that because we totally understand cars runs fast and we cannot run that fast as cars. So we don't compare that, but we drive the cars. This is uh, the, uh, the experience we can learn from the history. And today also learn from other fields. But some people may say uh, architecture are more about the creation. It's not just uh, uh, analyzing uh, some images. Yes, it's not. But uh, how, how are we 
um, like defining creation is a good question. Uh, here, I'm gonna share one of the image from OMA. This is how we do design, um, not just creation. Okay, this is the first step. We find out uh, uh, maybe 100 ways or 100 models by the interns, juniors, those are typologies you can define uh, with the colors. So like the blue ones here, we have a uh, rectangular shape, square shape, and we're digging some holes there. And uh, the green ones are we uh, lie all the programs as a linear shape and we bound it. And this red are pixelated and be reorganized. This is a, um, kind of a way of designing the messing. But this is the first step of the design. So uh, what's the second step? Second step is the, the senior architect or project architect, we jump in and we say, okay, this is uh, not so good because uh, it is not fulfill the client requirement. And this is not so good because it's too expensive. And those are not good because the function is, uh, uh, or the circulation is not really uh, suitable. Anyway, there's a lot of reasons we think in our mind and we eliminate all other possibilities and we preserve the two or even three or five, whatever. Those are the decision making. So the second step is, uh, uh, let's say filtering the possibilities. So first is five possibilities, second is filtering the possibilities with our human brain and we think which one's better. And eventually when we come to this um, final call, we need to ask the boss, okay, Rem, what do you think? Rem said this one. But how I define this, how this thing become the final design is because he think differently from us or he has his own way of decision making. Uh, this is another example, uh, a, a, like a financial center of Kuala Lumpur, a competition design. And this is a final two option. One is a circular shape, another is a pixelated shape of towers. And uh, finally, how will Rem make decisions on this? It looks, so, I mean, meaning nothing, right? So how he make decision, just by the form? No. What he asked is, uh, what is the party's uh, um, agenda? Is this party want to be uh, something new? Yes, we said this party is new and they want to do something new. They want to unite the, the um, different uh, 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 regions, uh, different uh, people's uh, uh, beliefs and their, uh, their race. They want to be a, more united in terms of the, the, the mind. So this is a, the propaganda. Uh, then Rem said, okay. And the function is, yeah, we said it's a financial center. It's a working space, let's say. And say, okay, hey, made his call. This uh, left one, a rain shape or a circular shape. And this is how he make decision. He's uh, thinking something else, not just the form. So, uh, so this is uh, the way we are doing creation. Yeah, we first uh, finding possibilities, second uh, filtering it, and uh, thirdly we make the final call. What is the most important thing here? I think is how we make decision. It's based on our. I said previously, the methodology, the, the, the knowledge and experiments, uh, uh, yeah, experience and uh, our IQ. But these three things can be translated to the machine as well. Um, the calculation power, the algorithm and the data. So the, the machine is actually also doing it. Uh, this is uh, something uh, we find in 2015. It's a paper saying, how can we copy Van Gogh? Yeah, they tried to uh, learn Van Gogh's uh, um, painting style 
and uh, using this uh, uh, CNN get uh, a algorithm model and apply onto the image of uh, a canal and then you get the, a Van Gogh style, style um, canal image. This is uh, something they think is a, a creation, but not really actually. It is a, a copying of the style. But our uh, AI can really doing creation? I think it's yes. It depends on different type of uh, um, algorithms and how you're dealing with it. So uh, I, I'm showing what we are doing here uh, as XCool, how we do AI applications in architecture. So we think there are four major uh, directions. First is uh, discrimination, second evaluation and construction and generation. So when we're talking about um, creation, it can be contained in all those parts. If you're doing the possibility searching, possibilities uh, filtering, and finally decision making. So this is how we're thinking um, how we do creations. Uh, this is uh, also something we did in Digital Futures from 2018. Uh, in the first one, we did uh, with the, um, the, the street images to define what is the uh, passive, what is the uh, active area. And also there's other groups that are doing uh, other dimension of the analyzing or let's say discrimination. It will be easy. It will be very easy to help us to understand the street. You don't have to analyze it uh, image by image um, on the street to get what is the condition here. So this is a, a very easy use of the machine. And second one is we did in two thousand nineteen uh, the evaluation. And this one we are um, we are helping the the participants to uh, do some algorithms and you can upload your algorithm model and also select on the map which area you are using the data. So as I mentioned previously, we have the compu computational power because it's online already. And the, then the participant upload the algorithm and here we're providing the data and you get all those three st things down, then we can start in our evaluation. We can set up like, a, uh, we want to analyze the, the street nearby Tongji University. And uh, what is the major elements here in terms of the uh, quantitative uh, uh, ratios? So we can understand much better of the street is it looks green or it uh, looks very uh, open or uh, very dense? We, we can get uh, uh, more rational outcomes, results, and we can compare it. And eventually we can use those for our further uh, design or further analyze. And here we are using the uh, deep networks and uh, clustering, this is uh, in Tucson line. And there's something jumping uh, is uh, what we do in terms of uh, reconstruction. And this one, you guys can guess in what it is. Uh, I already using this example for uh, two or three years, but uh, still people looking at it and uh, thinking it's very fun because they say, okay, just the uh, houses, right? Images. Yes, but those images are not the the real houses photo taking images. They are images generated by the machine. And because we um, have a large database of this, um, um, let's say modern style or international style. And in this one, we can create a lot of uh, uh, similar style, but different results. And you can see um, from this uh, variation, it's, it's all image by image, but we made it into a um, short uh, video. But you can see they are changing in terms of the image itself. 
And these images, they can show us a lot of different things. And this procedure reminds me when we're doing a design. Uh, firstly, when we're searching the possibilities, we will like chase it back in our memory. What I have read, uh, what I have learned, what I have saw in the experience in our own database in our brain. And then we can say, okay, okay, I like this one or I like another one. But this procedure in our brain is very blurred. You cannot catch in the right moment sometimes. But here, machine can show us, can represent it in front of us or even with your client saying, okay, from the building A to building B to building C, which one do you like? Yeah, this is a very clear procedures. And it shows us the first step of creation as possibilities. And then is the decision making. You need to make decision, but there's a two levels of decision. First is the filtering, right? A machine can help us in terms of filtering. If you uh, tell it what you wanna do or what conditions you can set here, set up here. Yeah, and it's finally you make what you want. But that one is mostly uh, as the image is using, but our architectural field is more uh, related to the graphic. So we need to link the graphic and the image. And this one is uh, uh, something we did in the uh, uh, last uh, Shenzhen Biennale uh, in the Karatis uh, Pavilion. So you draw something on the left side Maybe it's a child drawing something or a architect drawing, an architect drawing something. And the right side machine can generate it. It's like a sketching. You sketch something and the, the design intention be uh, represented there. And uh, yes, our architectural field is not just graphic and image, but also um, the, the modeling, the 3D dimensional, yeah, 3D modeling. So we also need to somehow combine all those elements together. And then eventually we can go to the generation, uh, the real generation of the design in different phases. Let's say uh, this one you saw here or X2 who is doing quite a lot is the, the plot side uh, generation is for the residentials. Uh, that is the major development in China. So. This is uh, the scale we are working. And also there's other scales as well. Uh, for instance, the, the building block scale or in, even the internal scale. But uh, what we also see here is we are combining three things together. The artificial intelligence here is doing the, uh, let's say the algorithm part or the basic, uh, um, methodology part. And the machine intelligence is doing the calculation of power or the IQ part help us to do a lot of possibilities because they can keep working and working and no tired. And finally, the human intelligence is doing the decision making, is doing the uh, experience inputting. So we are thinking in the future, these three parts will still hand in hand together for quite a long time. It will become something like this. Uh, in the beginning, people doing quite a lot uh, in terms of uh, manual duty works and the machine doing less. But uh, gradually the machine will do more and more those uh, manual uh, repetitive works and people will do less. Like uh, today, the uh, the autopilot, the auto driving cars, we call it uh, auto driving, but uh, you understand people is uh, holding the wheel. People are driving it. It's not, uh, uh, it's not like Google car, there's no one in it. And that one cannot be, um, uh, cannot be really used uh, on the street right now, right? And what people do then in the future. So we are be all replaced and our we lose our job? Totally not. We are doing something even uh, more important. Like uh, we did this uh, metaphor of uh, cars. 
we are driving it, we are showing the direction of the car. We need to find out what is the, the meaning of doing those works is to create something or to resolving the issue. If we understand the answer of this question, then we can understand much better how should we um, living with the machine, living with the AI in the coming age. So finally, I will share a video of our office. And uh, our office here is not just a um, technology company. We are a technology company in the architectural field. And it's in, it's in uh, Chinese, but uh, you can see from images, it's showing what we're doing. We're using data to generate designs and make people to communicate with each other through the cloud. And also the machine can uh, kind of realize a new type of a format. We call it uh, ABC, AI Driven Beam on Cloud. With this format, uh, a lot of people can communicate and uh, the machine uh, and the model or the design result is be generated by the machine and people making the decision. And it, it is not just using for the residential, residential uh, typology. Also, it's not just using for the land, uh, the, the, the plot scale, but it's also using in all the scales of the uh, design. So this is uh, something we do as a company, uh, as an office. And uh, uh, I, want, I want also share a little bit more if I have time, Neil, I can, I can share a little bit more about- uh, Oh, sure, uh, sure, please, please. Yeah. yeah, okay. Uh, about our office in terms of the uh, composition about our team. Our team is not uh, uh, a, a purely uh, computer science engineers. No, we have a, a lot of architects or architectural background uh, people. They were studied in uh, everywhere. I mean, also from the States, Europe, also mainland China. They have different backgrounds. Some of those are um, worked in LDIs, the local design institutes. Some are working in uh, overseas offices. Some are just uh, uh, study uh, doing researches in the universities. And we have a lot of different uh, directions doing here. Because we are a technology company, we have a lot of uh, computer science people and they are doing the major, uh, let's say, software developing this part. And we also have the AI engineer, data engineer, or data scientist. Uh, they are also helping the R&D part. But the architects is uh, doing a lot of interesting things here. First of all, uh, we have a architectural uh, team called the ART, Architectural Research Team, ART. They are doing uh, the algorithm designs or algorithm researching. Uh, like uh, how can we use the algorithm to design a packing, parking plot? Or how can we use um, uh, the algorithm design to generate the landscape? So this is uh, uh, the, the essential architectural issue. It can only be described and uh, um, logically designed by the architects. You firstly have to understand the industry. And then secondly, they will pass on their Python code to our engineering team. They will make it into a real product. This is uh, what architects do in terms of researching. And we also have other architects, uh, they get the having uh, a lot of uh, LDI experience, but they are not, they cannot uh, uh, like uh, typing the code like Python, but what their input is more like a product design. They are a product in, uh, managers. They can design the different uh, procedures, how this product be uh, composed 
and uh, how the uh, UI, the, the interfaces are designed. So those guys, they are mostly uh, using their experience and knowledge to help us to create this uh, product. And also we have other architects, they are doing some um, not researching jobs, but uh, like uh, the business development or doing the, the, the cons uh, consulting, uh, supporting with our BD team. So because our clients are developers or uh, design institutes, our clients understand architecture a lot. So our people who is uh, talking with them need to understand this industry as well. At least uh, in a BD team, uh, there's a two guys, one sales and one people with uh, architectural background. And because we also need to training um, the architects or the designers or the developers to use our uh, SaaS uh, software as a service, our product. So they also need to teach them how to use it. So first of all, this guy need to understand the architecture. And eventually we got another part of uh, architects. They are more uh, like the, those or more similar to the traditional ones. They do practice. But the practice here in our office is not just practice. Uh, it's not our major work. This practice is to help the, the entire team to understand what is the, the demands of the real cases. We need to find out the pain points or the crucial issue in the entire procedure of the architectural design pro, uh, uh, practice. For instance, we're using um, very simple uh, algorithms or very simple um, models to, uh, to internally to help our practice team to generate something or analyzing something as you saw maybe something similar as the uh, digital future workshops. And we're using those uh, internally to get the results. So they are using the results to do in the practice. And uh, I think application is very important today. We're not just the creating products, but uh, we are solving issues. So this is uh, the major four, uh, let's say uh, professions in our office. We are not a typical uh, architectural office or we are not architectural office at all, but uh, we're something new combining these two majors together. Uh, and uh, yeah, this is our products. Maybe some people already saw it before. So I think that's it, Neil. If uh, people got the interests, I can also share some videos. That that's fantastic. When you it was you know I I, I kind of felt that I was we've been talking about science fiction a lot. Um, oh, this is, okay. Sorry, yeah, they just can play and we can talk. Yeah, uh, no, I we, we were talking about science fiction, um, especially with um, Riffig and Adol, uh, and there was a kind of strange science. Sci I know that you were interested in science fiction anyway, but there's a strange science fiction sense of what you're doing. I, I had a comment on, on one of the chats about this and someone was saying, I imagine this was happening in 2030, but not in 2021. So this is uh, in a way, uh, it's it's extraordinary to see this thing actually happening. Um, and uh, how many people are using your software right now? Uh, we are over, uh, we are over 10, uh, several, several, let's say nearly 100,000. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. And the other question I, I wanted to ask you was, um, I, I was talking earlier on about uh, um, how Harvard Hochland um, at Spacemaker was saying that the clients were insisting now that architects use AI. Do you find a similar experience that people are, uh, the clients are insisting that the architects use uh, Xcool software? Uh, in some cases, very limited. This is not a major thing right now, but uh, we do have this experience um, maybe Chinese people may know the the Baidance or yeah, states uh, the TikTok company. They get a project and they said uh, you need to using some algorithm design software such as Xcool to do their um, their their new uh, office design. This office is not just the internal office; means the plot, 
with the residential and the offices. So this is what they, they required. Sorry. Great. Th thanks, Wenyu. That was that was like a, a step into the future. Um, uh, really interesting. Um, really interesting. Um, yeah. Thanks, Neil. I think it's a, it's important to understand the, the relationship and to to take the advantage of the machine, not just saying, okay, we are be replacing. No, we're not be replacing. We are ruling it. We're driving it. <laughs> Yeah, I, yeah, that was a comment actually. Wolf Pricks once made is the, the the architect should be in the front seat mm -hmm. driving and, and the AI should be in the back seat. But I I yeah. I, I suspect that AI is going to be driving soon. That's my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, really, I think there's something we need to facing is the moral issue. We cannot ask a, an AI to take a responsibility in terms of assign the design and deliver to the authority to approval. It's an impossible, for, at least today. So maybe in the future, they will say, uh, you need to get something done by the AI, or need at least some part analyzing or reviewed by the AI. But uh, yeah, for now, at least in the coming years, people are the, the dominator. Yeah, for, I think for, for now is probably the right the right expression. Fantastic, thank you, Wan Yu. Um, this is thank great. Um, we will hope, maybe we'll have some questions in a, in a moment. Let me, and I want to just quickly bring in um, for our final presentation today, Runja Chan, also uh, from China. I mean, uh, and Runja is um, just finished his, his um, um, the Harvard GSD and is, I think, part of the next generation of kind of AI informed architects. So. Uh, Runja, um, please. Uh, um... Yeah. Yeah. Um, can I see my sharing? Yes. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Um, yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Runja Tian. Um, I current GSD uh, MDES Technology 2021 graduate and a research assistant at the Lab for Design Technology at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. Uh, I would uh, first like to sincerely appreciate Professor Leach for the invitation to this wonderful consortium on architecture and AI, which has been such a inspirational journey for me. Uh, Digital Future um, is a transformational platform uh, experience for me because I participated in last year's workshops uh, and conferences. And uh, I'll be also really proud and exciting to contribute to one of the workshops um, this year. Um, and I would also like to thank Theodore and uh, Wang Yu for the wonderful presentation today about infrared and as cool platforms. They're just amazing. Um, and from my perspective, I think I could share some of my experiences uh, as a researcher, as well as as a uh, open source AI and architecture project uh, maintainer. Um, being as an architect, I have always been interested in multidisciplinary practice across the domain of architecture. I firmly believe that the future of design lies in the synergetic engagements of computer graphics, creative computing, and extended reality, and of course, liquid intelligence. So um, as previous um, guest speakers have already shown, architecture and AI could be defined from multiple facets. Uh, as Sildo just pointed out about the, um, like the inspiration that architecture design can learn from the um, gamings um, and where the real-time feedback uh, of the human com computer interface is a really platform and a speculative design experience. For me, the notion of architecture and AI is also embodied in the form of game. Uh, as researchers at DeepMind have pointed out, games are an excellent way um, of testing art, uh, the benchmarks of artificial general intelligence. They provide a rich suit of tasks which players must develop sophisticated behavioral strategies to master, but they also provide an easy um, progress metrics, game scores, to optimize against. DeepMind combines uh, an algorithm for efficient exploration with a virtual microcontroller uh, that can place the Atari games. So they initially launched the projects in um, 2015, and the, um, they trained an intelligent agent with deep reinforcement learning to use the visual input, such as the uh, screen pixels, as well as the scores of the game. And the agent immediately can beat uh, 49 games in its initial launch against human players, testers, um, in 2015. 
And six years later, the intelligent agent achieved uh, superhuman performance on all 57 Atari games in the year 2020. This research bridges the divide between the high dimensional sensory input and actions, resulting in the first AI that is capable of learning to excel as a, at a diverse array of challenging tasks. And it's probably the first AI that um, works Turing, uh, completes Turing tests across multiple tasks at the same time. So um, this motivates to me to think about the potential of using games as a matrix uh, or as a methodology for measuring the intelligence of architecture, artificial intelligence. So in, in that sense, can we uh, create games that can represent the Turing test for architecture designs? So as proposed by a neuroscientist, um, as a Leslie design combination can be defined as a fundamental ability to fabricate outcomes where intentional execution of plans on variables in the environment um, is um, enacted such that it results in favorable outcomes to the executor. So we can uh, have this like mental image of the design process as a black box in between. So um, I would like to propose a generative machine um, that can um, you, uh, act as a delegate between the environment variables and the outcomes to yield the designs from, um, from this black box. And our implementation level, uh, Mitchell Williams proposed computer-aided architecture design systems um, that are consisted of representation system, generation system, and testing system in the year 1975 at MIT. And I think this system um, is like a really good model for the consecutive generative design systems. Uh, which I would like to propose to use as the ideal implementation of generative machines. And, and, um, and with this framework, we can frame a lot of like the existing state-of-the-art um, architecture AI uh, algorithms in, this, um, three uh, in terms of the three systems. So for example, the project refinery um, uses a rule-based algorithms. And um, so yeah, it's defined as a rule-based generative games. Um, and the Archigam projects um, um, that are introduced in year, 20, uh, in year 2020 is uh, using a 2D image and pixel value to represent architecture design. So I would call this type of game a 2.5D or 2D generated game because it's essentially using 2D image as the um, ultimate uh, delegate of the architecture designs. And more recently, we have 3D uh, generative adversarial network, which uses voxels for the generation of 3D interior space and the whole scan from uh, Autodesk, which uses a, a relational graph topography to infer the architecture flow plan layout. So I would call this type of exploration the semantic games, which, you, which translates sort of like a semantic um, like collection into a geometry of architecture designs. And um, what's more recently is the Fusion 360 gallery dataset, which um, uses um, an inactive model and reinforcement learning for um, like the training of uh, constructing CAD models out of human um, out of human design and uh, human CAD sequences. So, uh, in the following sections, I would like to briefly introduce my past explorations in each of these um, um, aspect of uh, games and uh, how I maintain like open source project for uh, each of these research. So, the first two point five D game is actually a paper that I presented in the conferences and in the last year's digital future conference suggested that planning with conditional gain and urban gene data. So uh, the pixel pix image image translation is used a lot in uh, modern, uh, sorry, in, in recent architecture and AI explorations. So um, yes, this project, um, I propose to use uh, the pix to pix technology for the suggestive site planning uh, because we have a lot of like uh, data for urban design because and, and all of the GIS data set. And those data are still untapped, but they contain a lot of implicit knowledge about how urban design is um, actually uh, existing uh, out there in the field, in the wild. So I created this pipeline to scrape uh, ArcGIS data and um, aggregate the data, the buildings on, onto each the uh, street blocks. And, um, cut, and because the GIS data also contains um, function building of, or, or urban um, zoning coding of build, uh, sorry, zoning a function of the building. So we can color code each of the building according to the different zoning codes. And then we, we can create this uh, data set that infers the building of different types based on the, uh, the shape of the site boundary. Um, so the, the data script of the buildings, street walls, and trace data from um, the city of Boston. And um, 
I develop this pipeline and to, to uh, scrape the data and color code each of the building according to the land use code of the city of Boston. And then I prepared a um, data set ready for the peak-to-peak -peak image image translation and trained them on a GPT accelerated uh, device. And the result um, was realized in random grasshopper uh, using like a GAN server. And this is like the uh, typical 2.5D and two or 2D version of uh, using uh, the, the generative game. And this is maintained as the open source project on my personal GitHub. So feel free to visit and um, create pull requests. The second um, exploration that I did is to generate the 3D objects. Um, so what which I call the 3D games. So um, it's highly inspired by the uh, latent space exploration experiments that uh, are like um, popular in the domain of design and computation. And where the latent work video uh, from generative adversarial networks can generate a continuous sequence of images that are visually similar to each other. So um, the idea for use uh, leveraging the power of latent walk video is to use each, each of the image and stack them vertically to form a continuous section of, um, of pixels, as you can see in the image stack. And uh, once we um, like, we can retrieve the pixel information based on the color that we prefer, and then um, extract the uh, image pixels out of each of the stack of layer of the, uh, of the image, and then create a voxelization of the entire continuous uh, image stacks. And we can then use Martin cube algorithm to, trans to translate this voxel as they voxels into a mesh object that has a continuous sections of that are predicted by the, that are generated by the latent walk um, video. And more, um, so if those uh, latent walk stack uh, still have some 2.5D um, like taste, then the exploration with the beam walks and um, PyTorch 3D again, um, it's a like purely 3D generative train, um, exploration. So I first trained on the shape night provided by uh, Princeton University uh, and perform a real time inferences um, of a latent walk, uh, latent space walk for the 3D again. So as you can see, this is essentially generating chairs uh, that are similar to each, each other in, in, ter in terms of styles. And it's essentially, you can interpolate different categories of objects using the similar technology. And further, I um, experimented with how we can generate 3D shapes um, use, uh, for architectures. But it turns out that the original voxel that you generate uh, furniture is actually not enough for generating architecture because you, there is essentially more details in the architecture spaces. So at least, uh, I think, 128 um, dimension is, is required for representing architecture. This is like the uh, 128 uh, representation for Villa Subway and also 20, 256 Vila Subway. So I created this personal, uh, I created this dataset by, data by modeling the, um, some of the buildings from Le Corbusier and try to perform some uh, shape interpolation as well as uh, shape generation from using this uh, 3D GAN pipeline. And this is still being explored because the 128 um, definition for 3D GAN uh, is still challenging for most of the GPU um, memories. And I think the workflow should, uh, could be in, could be optimized in the future for, uh, for the ease of training. And this is also maintained as the open source project in my GitHub. Um, and I'll uh, go over quickly about the semantic games, which is uh, um, quite similar to the Autodesk uh, house scan, uh, but we more focus on the uh, data pre-processing -pre and provide uh, accessibility too for the app designers to process the um, Cubicasa 5K data set and generate their own um, data set about architecture and a graph that they can uh, customize. So one of the interesting questions that uh, we, are, we are exploring is the translation from the bubble diagram to a real architecture floor plan drawing. So we wonder, um, this is like a typical operation in architecture design process for human designers. Can we simulate a similar translation using a neural networks? So we find this Kibikata 5K data set, which is a uh, a uh, large scale floor plan data set containing more than 5,000 examples and are well annotated into SML labels. So we created our own Python library to, um, pro to process the SVG objects and um, we can parse out the graph information, the room connectivity between different rooms uh, and, and the geometry information for each of the room in the floor plan. And once we have this data um, um, like separated, we can perf perform this graph to image translation using graph convolutional neural networks 
proposed by um, a research lab at the Stanford University. So this is essentially translating from the graph domain to image domain. So it's like um, like a synthesis between the languages and to the actual geometry and shapes. And uh, what I'm, I really want to show here is the interface that you can use to generate a floor plan based on the input dam uh, bubble diagram. So it's essentially like playing a game, like you use like a um, like the UI to actually explore the possibility of um, design space uh, in, in this like um, interactive process. Um, and the last project that I want to show is uh, quite different from the previous three projects, which uh, is part of my thesis advised by Dr. Jose Luis at the Harvard GSD. I refer to that as uh, the inactive game. So um, and a more challenging task here um, for the computer-aided uh, design system is actually the generation system. Due to the limitation of generation generation algorithms, we either um, need need to uh, we neither um, re are restricted to certain rules, for example, like uh, using rule based algorithms, um, or they are restricted by the human design um, data, such as like um, like using we have to use data to train our um, neural networks to fit to certain uh, criteria and find a local minimum. But can we create like a machine that can explore the, the designs and incrementally learn? by uh, those design strategies out of the inactive process. Uh, just like, um, just like um, the inactive learning process for human infants, uh, where the uh, human infants use um, intuitive plays or um, playing with ob throwing objects to learn the intuitive physics and um, about the physical properties of their objects around them. So this is called the sensory motor learning process for, um, for infants. And um, yeah, and this can, this idea is, is largely used um, as a as a paradigm for deep reinforcement learning, um, where self supervised approaches are widely used in the late, latest advancement of artificial intelligence. So one of the examples is uh, definitely the um, mastering the game of Go with um, deep neural networks, the AlphaGo paper. Um, and another game is uh, another really interesting example from is from OpenAI where the, uh, the AI agents gradually learn strategies to play hide and seek um, by manipulating their environments. So essentially, as you can see on the red, red side of the image, the blue, the blue team is trying to hide from the red team and the red team is trying to catch the blue team. So the blue team uh, gradually learns how to block the door and the red team um, then learns how to use a ramp to um, access the, in, the, inner, um, the, the, the inner area of, uh, behind the wall. So can we create um, a game that, or can we create like a, 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 a simulation of or training of intelligence that can simulate the emergence of, of architecture intelligence? I firmly believe the answer, answer is yes. As Bernard Rudowski pointed out in his famous book, Architecture Without Architects, Rudowski frames that we discuss the art of building as a universal phenomenon and look at the total picture of architecture. We can see the power of the communal architecture. I would also want to echo uh, one use example of the legendary Yu Chao from um, mid China and the Toda Mount Ham Hamlet and Barawadi houses, where the ancestor of human beings dealt with the external wars by experimenting um, tectonic strategies and manipulating their uh, initial environment. Um, so, those like um, vernacular architecture are not produced by specialists, but by the spontaneous and continuous activity of a, uh, like of a whole people. So such arch a vernacular architecture requires human intelligence and emerging philosophy and practical knowledge of untutored builders from their inactive learning process of how to build a primitive shelter within and against nature. So if we can create learning environment for training intelligence that creates Go or Atari games in quasi-human or superhuman performance, can we use a similar paradigm to train such intelligent agents to play the architecture generation game? So here I propose um, Inactive Genesis, a framework for generative architecture uh, with um, schema-centric AI and deep reinforcement learning. So I also made some um, modification to the generation system. For example, can use uh, open source Beam project for the generation of design uh, due to its like highly flexibility and the universality of the system because it can essentially generate anything with uh, like a Beam system and it's neurosymbolic, so it's easier for the computer to learn the distribution of such patterns, and um, and as um, and so by taking uh, and so I represent the beam as the execution graph uh, in Grasshopper. 
So the agent is actually manipulating um, the grasshopper graph to generate architecture designs. So for example, the, if the agent decides to add a wall in some place in the design graph, then the uh, state action tree goes to the adding graph, um, adding, sorry, adding wall on uh, action in the state action tree. And each of the, uh, and each path in the state action tree represents a unique design. So we are essentially training an agent that takes consecutive uh, actions to generate some architecture designs by manipulating a grasshopper file. And this is maintained as the open source library as well in my personal GitHub. Uh, so you can just use this as a generation of beam systems and you run a grasshopper. So this is the actual look, how the computational graph looks in, uh, in, in the real world. And you can compute uh, really complicated designs out of this system. For the testing system, uh, I propose to use um, a um, human-centric um, simulator for actually calculating the architecture uh, experiences by uh, capturing the Cicero experience data and the body experience data. To actually implement the system, I used a um, embodied simulation for uh, testing for the testing generation in the um, in the multimodal game simulation engine Unity with a semi-autonomous navigation robot. So if we generate the after we generate the design, we just throw a robot into the scene. Um, and then like uh, we let the robot to collect the visual data uh, when it navigates around. And um, we use this um, video data that the robots collected to evaluate the quality of the architecture space, just like we human experience the architecture spaces. And um, this is like the, essentially the, uh, the path for the robot, uh, homotanean pass in, uh, in, the, in the existing scene. Uh, and I'm using um, the like um, phenomenal transparency for the evaluation of the generated space. So here I, I propose a calculation of phenomenal transparency uh, by first generating the space and then perform a depth, de uh, depth image generation from the scene. It's essentially uh, very accessible in the game engine to generate a scene depth. And then if we perform edge detection on the generated uh, depth image, then we can get uh, the number of transitions of spatial depths within a certain perspective point of view from human observer. So um, I think that essentially lies uh, closely with the concept of phenomenal transparency, phenomenal transparency in Colin Rose writing about, um, about the, architecture, the transparency in architectural spaces. And if we add all the image pixel values of the um, edge detection on the depth Im image to, uh, together, we can get a reward for the um, transparency value for the system, for the general design. And lastly, we use a, P a policy proximal, proximal policy optimization reinforcement learning algorithms for the training of this agent. Here are some of the immediate results. Uh, first, some uh, a, gener a random generation as a benchmark, and then I trained the, um, the the agent on a 2D setting with 10 actions uh, allowed. So essentially, the, the agent is trying to learn how to generate 2D floor plan that has a high phenomenal transparency value. So at the first, the reason just randomly throw something into the 2D floor plan without any, any, uh, without any like um, observed patterns. But after around 1,000 steps, the agent gradually learns the strategy to generate uh, longer walls and, um, and a column that are distributed in the periphery area of the, of the floor plan and gradually convert to sort of like a local minimum for the 2D generation. But this is like a, actually a bad case because the 2D Reward state is actually very sparse, so it may have many ways to lead to like the optimal policy. And then I tested this against a different three D setting, where more actions are allowed. And but um, due to the limit of computational power, I trained this for seven hundred episodes. And as at the first, it's very similar that agents just randomly generate um, three D floor plans, sorry, three D designs uh, of um, walls, slabs, and columns. And then around like um, episode um, 400, the agent gradually learns to generate less uh, walls and columns and more uh, floating slabs because of the uh, punishment of um, accessibility and um, to maximize the uh, transparency value. So as you can see, approaching the end of the training, the agent is already generating like, a, um, it's already learning some distribution of generating more slabs and less columns and walls. Uh, for the ease of um, for the ease of walk and for the high um, phenomenal transparency value at the same time, so this is like um, like the training like visualization of the training process, 
uh, which is essentially like you play a architecture design game, uh, but it's actually not a human play, but a machine that uh, play with itself. And it's just trying to experiment um, the strategies uh, as much as it can, and then learns what is the optimal, um, what is the optimal uh, like strategy to design, to design architecture. Uh, and this is, is uh, essentially self-supervised and it does not rely on any external human uh, data set. So I will call this type of game a different name compared to the previous three, uh, the inactive game, because it's just essentially exploring the world and receive some rewards uh, that are defined by um, the rules or physics. Um, this is also the, the, the beam part is also open source in my personal GitHub uh, and feel free to um, create any pull request. Um, yeah, uh, and uh, or like contact me through my GitHub account. And I think at the end of the presentation, I would like to use a quote from Alan Turing to end it. Like, presumably, the children's man is like a notebook as one byte from the stationaries, rather little mechanisms, and a lot of blank sheets. And I think, um, like, the, our explorations today are really meaningful in the sense that we are actually using the, um, the first pins to write on the blank sheets of hum, uh, human arch architecture intelligence. So, um, thanks everyone um, for watching. This is the end of my presentation. Runji, that was that was fantastic. <laughs> I'm blown away by that. I have a question though. I, you 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 had this agent. You got you called it a robot that was evaluating um, uh, the space, and I, I just wasn't quite clear how on what terms. What was it looking for in terms of valuation? How was it judging the space around? Yeah, uh, sorry. I, I thought this part is yes. It's, it's it's true that it's kind of like hard to um, explain. But I'm actually um, using two rewards functions uh, for the robot. So the first one is actually um, that I didn't mention uh, um, so clearly is the accessibility value. So uh, when we generate a pass for the robot uh, based on some um, room division algorithms, um, we are actually um, compute how, how far the robots can walk or how many points of the um, total number of points is accessible uh, from the robot. So this is used as a measurement of um, how accessible the space is generated, because the robot will just uh, receive a sequential number of points from the system that it has to explore. Um, and the robot then just uh, uh, try to visit all the points. But if there are some walls intersecting with each other are blocking each other, the robot cannot go to those points. And those means that there are some areas in the floor plan that are not accessible. So this is like how we compute the accessibility. Um, yeah, so it's like uh, it's it's negation of traversing steps at the number of points traversed minus total point uh, by one hundred. Uh, another score is uh, probably more complicated. Is the calculating the transparency is that um, it's like for each of the three the robot um, um, visit, it just calculates the score of transparency based on that video frame, and then it uh, gives out a average um, score across all the frames. That it takes um, around the architecture spaces, so uh, yeah, maybe this one has a better visualization. Um, is that um, yeah, when you generate a space in the in the in the in the Unity, the robot just try to uh, walk around the space, and some of the point it cannot visit, then this becomes a punishment. And then uh, on the third image of the robot's camera, it's looking at how many edges um, it can detect in the depth map. And use that as a calculation for the uh, like phenomenal transparency. Yeah, and that's how the, um, kind of like UD optimizing the robot's um, behavior. Yeah, the, the agent's behavior. Sorry. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah, but but there's no kind of as yet any uh, kind of let's say aesthetic evaluation, and I'm not quite sure how you'd even do that. But uh, I guess that would be. Uh... Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I have been thinking about this um, before the presentation today, is that um, we have this explicit metric to, that we can calculate, but we can also incorporate um, implicit metrics such as using like um, like aesthetics or statistical um, observations to to see what, to evaluate whether the generated design matches the human accessibility, uh, aesthetics perception uh, or matches architect's uh, aesthetics perception. So that's like an added, uh, addable or explainable framework that you can add more modalities of evaluation. Yeah. Wow. 
<laughs> let's i mean i don't we i don't we got going to be a few minutes left I, I just want to see if there's any discussion between um i don't know it'd be great to hear what whether daniel bolajan or theodore or or when you or whatever would like to um exchange some thoughts um daniel do you want do you want to say something or are you uh i'll just uh I, it sounds like it's it, you know it's ongoing uh, ongoing research, Brunja. That I mean, I could see that you 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 you're approaching it in a very methodological point of, um, um, uh, approach, taking a very methodological approach. But it's it's ongoing research, and I think it looks very promising. Um, but I do think that the kind of how you might be able to in a three dimensional domain understand aesthetics or evaluate aesthetics is going to be incredibly complicated, um, and I'm not quite sure how you'd approach it. Yeah, I think it's an interesting approach in special because right now in architecture, we don't have that many examples of uh, reinforcement learning. So I think it's a very interesting approach. And also like, it's a very unconventional approach that may be it's something that actually is good. You have um, this kind of idea of space transparency and that's how you organize space and so on. Actually, I think that, that maybe it's a, a way to get out of this kind of uh, way of thinking that we are used to, like the way we organize space, yeah. So uh, I think from that perspective alone, yeah, just imagine that you were to design a project from with that kind of concept, already the, the project would be super interesting, yeah. But to have an AI actually that um, uh, starts to design that kind of way, I think that's uh, amazing. Now it's possible that um, because uh, I see that you start to connect things and uh, with different networks, it might be that yes, you have different types of networks yeah, for uh, for aesthetics, yeah, for evaluations of aesthetics. So. It's just a matter then, okay, which is the, the correct net or network to do that and how you connect it to, to that uh, reinforcement learning. But I think still the idea is still uh, interesting. Why is it unconventional? Um, because usually conventionally, we just think in terms of organization, like bubble uh, diagrams, you know, yeah. And he's uh, looking at uh, a reinforcement learning algorithm that. Uh, learns to organize the space based can, based on that kind of idea of transparency of the space. I think from that perspective, it's very unconventional. And uh, it's unconventional in the in a good sense, yeah, because it uh, could lead to actually very, uh, very novel uh, outcomes, yeah, that we never thought of because we are stuck into this kind of model of bubble diagrams or something, you know. I mean, just to say, I think I think that uh, well, there is a reinforcement learning has been used um, with a robotic arm in fact, this was an Autodesk project, but they learned to, they were trying to develop some sense of motility in, in stacking Lego bricks, which actually is quite simple for humans to do, but it's extremely difficult for, for, for robots to do. And, um, but the, and, and they, they're, they're working at it from that point of view. I mean, one of the things about reinforcement learning, which I think is really a, a astonishing, is if you're working in the space of the computer, time becomes a different issue. So in, in, uh, I think that the, the the story about AlphaGo Zero, and I forget exactly. I'm sure that that when you can correct me on this, that it was able to play something like four million games of Go against itself in three days, and I think it worked out at twenty games of Go per second. So, uh, although it's a, a challenge, you can you can actually you can work with it in in, in a productive way. Yeah, um, was that right, Wanyu? Do I get the right? Yes. Uh, yeah, AlphaGo has a two generations or even three. The first one using the, the CNN, it have to learn a lot of uh, uh, previous uh, Go games as it's uh, data inputting. But the in reinforcement learning gave it a new uh, identity. It can uh, use the rules to create a, a lot of things we have never saw before. This is the most interesting part. Theodorus, do you like to comment on that? Uh, for me, like, I have my doubts with RL, like the traditional RL. Uh, it works well. It's very, like, it has some issues, like it's very brittle. Uh, it has a lot of hyperparameters that are, need to be fine tuned for every specific problem. And then suddenly when you get that setting to a real world problem, nothing works. Uh, you know, there is this whole like story and jokes about the, the random seed, you change the random seed, nothing, you know, you can replicate it. So it's very brittle, right? And as I said, at least in our, in our domain, it's used as an optimizer, not really as training agents. So I really can see it as 
as two ways, like either you do it in a multi-agent environment, right? Actually trying to learn, I don't know, policies and things that can work independently after and not just optimize something, not like, you know, according to a metric. Or I think what is very interesting is the, the approach that I showed last time with a decision transformer, which is literally changing the whole RL point into a, a language sequence, almost modeling. So, and that makes sense for design because design is a sequence process in a way. Like you can formalize it like that. It's easier to understand for people, I think, easier to generate data sets because you literally just, you know, you give it like, what you would like to achieve and what comes out. So, so you, I think that might be an interesting way, but all the rest, they have many problems. It doesn't mean we shouldn't try, but there are problems to solve, like sampling efficiency and all this stuff. So yeah, it's, it's still to be determined in a way, but this upside down RL, this, this is how, where this decision transformer comes, where you first give it what you want it to do or to achieve or how the reward is, and then it creates something. And uh, that one I see as very potential for architecture. Great. Okay. We should maybe wrap up, but this is, I mean, this has been a great session. So I really want to thank everyone for the contributions um, and also for Daniel's contribution. I think uh, this is only just you know, vindicating the notion that maybe we could, uh, this platform as a space for interaction, for exchanging ideas is incredibly productive. and. Uh, I'd love to think about how we can take that further and, and have a space for um, research based ideas to as a ongoing uh, platform. Um, thank you, Runja. That was fantastic. Thank you, Wen Yu. That was something out of science fiction. It was amazing. Theodorus, I always love your presentations. Really, really thought provoking. And, and Daniel, that, your, your interventions are always, always really, really provocative too. So this has been a really great session. I feel a sh it's a shame to say there's only one more session to go. Um, uh, we, we're looking at the city uh, to, uh, for, for our final session. Um, I feel like I want to go on for more, but uh, there we go. Um, I'm also, I'm giving a talk tomorrow, well, actually tomorrow, for me tomorrow, for tonight, in if you're in China, uh, on the architecture and philosophy session. Um, and then, to, then the day after is going to be Patrick Schumacher. Um, who uh, will be presenting things. So um, thank you so much today for everyone. And thank you, I wanna also just, I have to say this every single time, but it's, it's so important, the team behind here, you know, I, I think that uh, Gustavo, Virginia and so on, who are making this happen, this is all being done uh, by volunteers who are incredibly generous with their time. And I hope that uh, everyone's appreciating this. I think this is an astonishing um, contribution they're making. We're establishing some kind of platform for some kind of thing, I'm not quite sure what, but this has been a great session. Thank you so much. Um, uh, so we'll see you again in 24 hours time. Thank you, Wanyu. Thank you, Wunja. Thank you, Theodorus, um, for your presentation. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Yeah, thank, you. You. thank you all. Bye. Bye-bye.